Battletoads is like so good, you know. Mm-hmm. And there were, you know, it's you could kind of laugh at it, like they were just trying to do a Ninja Turtles. Sure, yeah. But it's hard. It's hard to do a Ninja Turtles. Ninja Turtles are good. How yeah. do you, how do you top that? Yeah, you know. Well, everyone was competing. It was the mascot wars. Yeah, yeah. Welcome to Hair of the Dogcast, everybody. Uh, let's have some beer. All right. Hair of the Dogcast is a proud member of the HyperX Podcast Network. For more information, check out podcast.hyperx.com. I'm Brad. What's up, everybody? How we doing? I'm doing well. My name is Dylan. Uh, I'm here. Just got back from some travel. Ready to podcast. Ready to talk about uh, some games. Uh, I'm Tyler. Um, I have a mustache now. Big development in my <laughs> life. A, okay, if you couldn't hear it, he does have yep. a mustache. Now. I have a mustache now, which is a big development in my life. I'm it's very a big excited. development. Okay. Yeah, I normally have some other facial hair going on, but this time I was like, you know what? Are you just going to be a mustache guy? I think, I think it's a mustache kind of summer for I me. I think you. I think you're fucking killing it. The Thank mustache you. summer sounds like a horrible indie film. You and your uh, you your Perfect. mustache and your backwards cap and a ghost T-shirt. Oh, well, you had a sunglasses on when you walked in. I'm like, who's this guy? Oh yeah, I'm kind of. I bought, a concert I'm over. Kind of, kind of a big deal. Yeah. I'm Selleck over here. Dude, podcast for a few <laughs> months and he's just like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah, actually, yeah. Uh, we also have a guest with us today. That's me, Jordan. Um, Jordan Davis, uh, NES developer from here in Milwaukee. Um, yeah. And I uh, figured I'd join you guys for a talk about video games today. Yeah. Welcome to your, uh, the first regular Dogcast. We've been happy to talk with you a few times before at MGC. Mm-hmm. But, yep. Uh, and I don't know if it was announced yet. It wasn't announced at MGC that you are going to be a published developer on the Switch. Yeah, it was announced at MGC. No, so. Before or after we talked with you, I yes, believe. Yeah, I believe so, yeah. Fuck yeah, man. That's yeah, awesome. so my first game, Space Raft, which is a game about my rock band here in Milwaukee, which is a game set in Milwaukee as well, is uh, is getting published to the Switch through Premium Edition Games and Nintendo. Uh. Um, on the digital side too, so yeah, um, physical edition of compilation of NES games is coming out. Ah, pre-orders start I think at the end of summer. Ah, uh, so. it's an automatic for me. Yeah, the van is on the cover. It's yeah, it made the cover. <laughs> yeah, I didn't see the van out there. No, uh, no, no, on the cover of the yeah. the game. Oh, okay, that's yeah. awesome. The van is no longer. The van has left us, unfortunately. It was sent to the scrap heap burr, 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 up burr. in the sky. <laughs> Thank you for your service. Yeah, yeah. Um, you get, so, do, have you talked to like some? You feature some local areas mm-hmm. in the game. Did you tell like Cactus Club, like, hey, you're going to be on the Nintendo Switch? Well, you know, I guess I haven't told anybody specifically besides just my friends. But are are you are you actually using the names of places? Uh, yeah, I went and because I included places of that I was friends with, basically. Okay, so um, people who wouldn't mind you exactly. using them. So I went and asked everybody's permission okay. who, who was uh, featured in the game. And that includes all the personalities, too, because all the NPCs in the game are basically different uh, music promoters and other independent musicians and stuff in the area. Honestly, what an honor it would be to be in a video game. You have, like, <laughs> I'd be like, oh, hell yeah. Yeah. You got to put me in the next one if you right get a on, sequel. <laughs> <laughs> or if you need any extra art done, Dylan's a very talented artist. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I I've been working towards getting <laughs> something that I can do digital work on again, mm-hmm. and if that happens, I'm definitely down for doing something. Just get like an etch a sketch or something. Yeah, yeah, an etch a sketch or like a wo- <laughs> like a woolly willy. A woolly willy. You've never seen those? It's it sounds like like some weird sex thing. Yeah. I feel. Why do I feel like the old man? You're 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 an old man. You're older than me. Maybe. You know what a a woolly willy is right uh it's the mustache drawing yeah so it's like uh it's a it's a shaker okay. where you it's have like a bunch a of dollar like store magnetic magnetic scraps yeah. yeah and then yeah. you put them onto his face to make different types of facial oh hair. i know what that is i didn't know yeah. what it was called though you were playing that with yourself that's how you want to put the mustache <laughs> yeah 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 and then you're like comparing in the mirror and you're like that would look good it I, I remember cool. knockoffs of those as well like you just see them around yeah. you'd see them at the dollar store or something i, I feel I like they patented it that's... if you could make those today that would be a fun thing to do <laughs> oh yeah do you think children would find that fun well i sell it to children i mean no, yeah, you sell that at bars. You sell yeah. it in those like vending machines at exactly. punk rock bars. Oh, you yeah. do like a Bob, five bucks. You do a Bob Euchre or whatever, and like, yeah. and then you you draw a magnetic. A Melverine, exactly. Uh, ah, yeah. this oh, is actually that be, uh, that's a good idea. That's class. Giannis, that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. sell like crazy. 
Copyright. Uh, we'll have the dog cast one. Won't sell to anyone. No, Not even nobody us. wants her. <laughs> nobody wants her variants. I'm buying the, I'm buying the Milverine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely going for the Gruber. Yeah, the David Gruber. Ooh, yeah, the Gruber. I like that one. <laughs> Well, we're here to talk about some video games Absolutely. today, uh, and it's been a while since we talked news. It's been a month since we had MGC, and we were too busy up to everything other than the news there. Yeah. yeah. So should we talk about some news? Yeah, I got some news. Um, we can start it off uh, with the fact that Master Chief is sexually active. <laughs> wow. That he, is, uh, he is having sex in the TV show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this, this was very exciting news to me. Um, in a bad way, but really? Oh, man. It's character assassination. Why? Master Chief is like one of the most iconic video game characters. He keeps his helmet on. He doesn't He doesn't like show emotion other than for his AI character. Otherwise, he's a fairly like, uh, I see two uh, perimeter cannons and he's like, I need a weapon. He just has badass one-liners yeah. and he will only break uh, like uh, the, the orders. He only breaks orders for... To protect Cortana, mostly. And the fact that he is an emotional wreck and he is fucking a prisoner, which is a war crime. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I had some issues with this. I did a little bit of research and I watched the scene. Yeah. Because I wanted to be well informed for this portion of the news. Was it uh, hot? No, it was weird. <laughs> it's very weird. It is super weird. Um, Cortana just watches. She's He does it in front of Cortana. <laughs> yeah, she just watches. And apparently it's with a Covenant spy. Who is a human, which is very yeah. weird in itself. It just feels like they, it feels like they found people who had never played Halo and were like, you want to make a TV show about Halo? Like, That's specifically what they did. This. That yeah. is what they did. Uh, they, they were very wow. proud. Like we've never played the games. We don't know anything about. That them. is so royally stupid. <laughs> well, do you know the funniest thing is? is uh, Matt's Matt's dad actually ended up watching it and really loved it. Uh, I just I'm so curious about like would any other entertainment medium hire scriptwriters that didn't care anything about the original yes. medium? They I would. suppose it's they do it all the time. Sadly, right? often. But probably. like, would you do would you do a Moby like a rendition of Moby Dick or something by somebody who just like never read the book, couldn't care less, didn't even understand that it was about whales? To I be feel, honest, I feel like the very baseline for getting that job is like you know the source material, right? And yeah, that should I would be, imagine that should. Be be a no-brainer but it seems like they can't figure that out and it's it's one of those things where uh you think that there would be somebody that would make the call like back when george lucas was running star wars that like every like expanded legends other things they'd have to just at least go through him like is it okay if we do this with the characters like that's fine whatever yeah and then sometimes he said absolutely not uh can master chief take his helmet off in the first episode we don't fucking care can he (laughs) fuck a person yeah whatever it's like there should have been Somebody in some, charge. I think they were. Oversight. I think they were just more concerned with a deal they had with Paramount, maybe. And Paramount required them to have this for their service. Mm. And it wasn't about quality. It was about we have to put it out. I think that COVID delayed this for quite a long while, if I remember correctly. This was announced a long time ago. So rushed production. Too many cooks in the kitchen. I think that's just the theme of all of this. Yeah, and when you don't know anything about the source material and you're trying to craft a story in this canon that you have no idea what to do with, you typically follow the normal story, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, Beats? Yeah. Like archetypes? So the, like they got to throw a love interest in there to keep audience engaged. This isn't the fucking CW, take... man. This is Halo. <laughs> but that's how they're going to treat it because they don't know how to make it. They don't you, know anything about Halo. you think that the writers would just pawn those stories off? Those, like, necess- like, the stories that are required by the studios, the stories would just get pawned off on the side characters because yeah. you don't want to break the character of your, like, main player characters, at least in your script. So you figured you'd just fill your quotas for the studio by pawning those off on side characters or whatever, which is right. real, where all the stories Storytelling in video games kind of tends to be anyway, because the player character is you, for the most part. Yeah, yeah you, so, so most of the time it is a the blank protagonist, and right. you are there. People are bouncing off of you, right? Uh, so yeah. video game protagonists tend to often be less interesting movie or television characters because they have nothing to say. They're just there to observe and to interact, kind of. Yeah. Well, even yeah. when they do have traits, it's usually very. Um, 
it is usually meant to because if 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 it is a power fantasy, it's usually meant to kind of like make you feel cooler than you are. Yeah. So like a lot of these characters, especially like you know like Nathan Drake and stuff, it's like you can look at the guy and you can be like. Well, I guess he has flaws, but not like really at the same time. So he doesn't do anything like egregious. He doesn't mm-hmm. have actual like character development. Right. No, he doesn't. Uh, I, I've been considering watching the the Uncharted movie. I've been I, I've seen it. Oh, um, I'm going to. I, I've seen it on one of the websites I go to, and I'm just like, no, I'm not ready to go there. It's a massive success, and there is going to be a sequel internationally, right? Yeah, yeah. China loved Uncharted. Oh yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I still can't reconcile Tom Holland. I can't mm. reconcile Mark Wahlberg as Sully. That's it. that's where I my brain's just a hard stop. Yeah, I can't do it. Yeah, that I don't think is, I don't think that's bad casting, but I think no. it's egregious. <laughs> yeah, uh, there. I mean, and a lot of issues with Master Chief taking off his helmet. They, he does it in the first episode in a very just whatever way, <laughs> which this is like a thing people they have creatively never showed us before. Mm-hmm. Like every time think, he does it in the games, they just they obscure it or they mm-hmm. cut away. It's an artful thing that's like treated with care and whatever, and, and they just it, discard the rules immediately. Yep, and they're yeah. like, nope. And I, I I haven't watched the show, but I have watched a lot of reviews of the show, and in like one of the final episodes, his face is just beaten up and bloodied. And they're like, well, you should have worn your helmet, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they made it for, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you got the strongest helmet ever made, the Mjolnir <laughs> armor, but. The helmet that survived a, uh, an impact from outer space. Another exciting uh, video game character that was recently featured in a movie, um, Chippendale Rescue Rangers. I watched it yesterday. Ah. Uh-huh surprisingly good it's okay. like a celebration of animation styles and they talk about like uh the uncanny valley and about how they the bad guy is peter pan from the 1940s really but he's like old and he's running like this super shady uh stinky cheese drug business oh, fuck. <laughs> his name is sneaky pete or, wow. or, just, or sweet pete it's really weird but uh there's like a convention where there's a bunch of people signing autographs, including one of the Chippendale Rescue Rangers, but they have ugly Sonic. The the original Sonic from the Sonic the Hedgehog movie is like really? there. Oh. <laughs> and he's like, we need your help. He's like, I don't really go fast. That's the other Sonic. I'm ugly Sonic. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Is was he like, voiced by Ben uh, Schwartz? I'm, <clears throat> I'm not sure, but it's got like Lumiere. It's got Baloo. It's got t- uh, Tigris. It's got a lot of really unique things. I don't know. I was surprised that the I stuff found that it. Disney didn't mind people using. How did they take Peter Pan, a beloved character, and like one of the main bad guys is Seth Rogen plays the Be- uh, Beowulf character from like that 2006 animated movie that was oh, trying no. to look real. Really? Oh no! Yeah, <laughs> the Robert Zemeckis joint. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's Seth Rogen plays him. It's really that was weird. Zemeckis, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember being really excited for that and just being so confused. <laughs> Like, not even disappointed, just baffled. Beowulf okay. is such a weird, like, thing to adapt in general. Because sure. it is just, like, it's one of the oldest books ever written. Sure. So. Which was why I was so excited about it. I'm like, this is going to be interesting. And then what they did was so not, I don't know. I don't, it, it just, it looks not right. Because, it doesn't look uh, good. <laughs> no. they, they, we hadn't mastered the Uncanny Valley back then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Kind of like that one Tom Hanks Polar Express film where everything just looks weird. Dead. Yeah. 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 I think even if they had just animated that movie and just didn't even try to pretend like it wasn't, it would yeah. have looked way better and it would have been much easier to follow. That is also a Robert Zemeckis movie. There is a, wow. There's the connection. Oh, really? They're both Robert Zemeckis, yep. Well, and then you have the new She-Hulk trailer, which people are doing massive complaints about, too, because the CG just doesn't look good. Oh. The CG in Moon Knight looked awful. I that whole car chase was CG. I didn't think the CG in Moon Knight looked that bad, but mm. compared to She-Hulk, I have a theory that they they released purposely bad CG so they can fix it up a little bit and people will think it's better, but sure. it's still below the quality that they would want, but... After you release Ugly Sonic, regular Sonic looks a hell of a lot better. It's true. If they're if they're playing like an advertising game, I could understand it, but I don't know. I these Marvel shows, what am I going to do with them? Yep. I'm going to watch them. It's a lot of work personally. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, I'm like, oh, I'm supposed to care about this. You want to okay. keep up on them. Yeah. Yeah. Death Stranding is getting a sequel according to Norman Reedus. Yay. When asked in a wide oh, raging what? Dude, they what? have to unite the world, man. Uh, yeah. When asked in a wide ranging interview about everything he's been up to, everything from The Walking Dead to what he does in his spare time, the interviewer said, uh, and 
in quotes, filming Death Stranding video game. And that's how they, they ended their sentence. And Redis replied, we just started the second one. Um, and I guess now, I, got, I got shivers. It's worth noting, though, <laughs> uh, just to throw a little wrench in the works, that him saying uh, we just started the second one may not be a reference to a Death Stranding 2. It could just be another game he's doing oh, with Kojima. Okay. and Because they did the Silent Hill teaser. The and PT. Then, yeah. And then they did Death Stranding. They could just be working on a different game, but I think it makes most sense that it's probably just Death Stranding 2. Kojima responded with this news. By like I don't forget it was Instagram or Twitter or something. It was a bunch of pictures of him and Norman Reedus hanging out, and it says "Go to your room." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then apparently he dropped a photo of him playing with toys, and it said "experimenting." And a bunch of fans are saying, "Oh, he plays with toys when he's writing a new game." Yeah. Apparently that's a thing that yeah, he's supposed to keep track of. Yeah. I didn't know that. It's how he visualizes. Yeah, but I think Death Stranding Two makes sense. I don't think it does because I love that ending more than pretty much anything i love like the themes and every, like they wrapped up all these themes so yeah. well and they're so with a real bow on it you stopped extinction how like how do you go from there well the rest of the world still needs to be brought together they don't even know if the rest of the world exists because they don't want to travel on norman the reedus in a sombrero what if death stranding 2 that would be cool. yeah. was like sailing uh, oh like oh. water world kind Ooh. of <laughs> Like it's him. It's him. Like setting out to explore. What's the black stuff called? The slime. Oh my scary. god! The scary. The scary. I forget the ocean what it's of, called. It's the ocean of the scary. <laughs> that sounds like something Kojima would make. Which is which is funny because Death Stranding is going to come up in later conversation. So I can't even remember what it's called. We are, had a whole podcast about it. Are you a big modern gamer as well? No. No. Okay. No, I have. And it's not necessarily by choice. It's by uh, exposure. Um, I have been on a break the last 15 years or so. Wow. That is a pretty big break. <laughs> well, so I, I got myself a Switch this year in January. So I've been kind of working my way up. But it's still kind of hard for me because I'm still kind of stuck in the retro gaming camp yeah so r right around 2017 or 18 i started playing a lot of nes games on my emulator mm -hmm. and then about 2000 by 2019 the week of mg the week after mgc 2019 i pulled out my nes from the closet and i had about maybe 10 games stashed in there um and that has snowballed quite a bit <clears throat> yeah uh in the last uh what that's three years now sure yeah. yeah it's easy when you go to mgc there's just games everywhere you yeah. want to buy yeah. but i mean but between that and getting activated in the nes homebrew community like now i have probably 40 or 50 homebrew games and like i think the total number of nes carts in my house is somewhere around 200 that's very cool uh, and then famicom too oh yeah do you have, do you have one of those like famicom adapters where you can play no. no okay no i bought a famicom specifically just to test stuff on Okay. Um, so then I started collecting carts as well. Now I've got a, a nice little box. Um, and I just bought an Atari 7800 this week. Wow. So, yeah, going backwards is easy for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I buy a Switch and then it just like leads me to play more old games. Yeah. And you there's, know? I mean, a lot of uh, great indie titles all have a very retro feel too. And the Switch has a lot of yeah. cool options for pretty cheap if you go to the store. Yeah. And I think that like for me, I'm, I'm kind of playing catch up. Well, obviously, I'm playing catch up, but and it's a little overwhelming as to what I should see when, um, you know. Because so uh, right off the bat, have you played Shovel Knight? Uh, I haven't. Yeah, but I'm you very, should. You should play is, Shovel Knight. That is, yeah. my that would be my top recommendation. I'm very for well you. aware of it. I've been playing a little bit of Celeste, which is another one that's yeah. in my camp, I believe. Brad yeah. is a huge Celeste. Bloodstained Curse of the Moon is a very good Castlevania like. Yeah, not not uh, sim not uh, the what is it Curse of or something in the night. Not that one, but the NES Curse version. Curse of the Moon is what it's called. The NES one that they made. Mm -hmm. That one's oh, great. really? Okay. Yeah, they have Curse of the Moon 1 and 2, and those are both easy recommends I as well. I just got my copy of All Was Awakening. Have you guys heard of that? What? It's uh, it's an indie game from Sweden, I think. It's a kind of platformer Metroidvania. Okay. With kind of cartoony sprites, a larger kind of cartoony sprites, but it's like a little kind of circular maze type of thing. Okay. Um, so, but it's, it was an indie game that was made in NES specs, 
But then they went forward and actually made the NES version of it as well. So you can get it like on Steam and, and Switch and stuff. Mm-hmm. And that's like the kind of modern version. But because all the assets were developed using NES limitations, they were able to actually do the port later on. Do you have the physical of that? I just got it uh, yesterday. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. I was thinking about bringing it, but then it's a podcast, so I'd be like showing you guys. Like, well, I mean, this we, and everybody that else. doesn't matter. Yeah. We so now you can't it. see it. It'll never happen. <laughs> there we go. Next time. Next time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, um, yeah, so I've been playing catch up with modern games. And, you know, as much as I'm interested in modern stuff, I end up falling into other things like Streets of Rage 4 and stuff. Where well, that's like, a lovely video. It's game. like an update, modern update of some retro mechanics that I like. Mm-hmm. So that kind of stuff really. Have you ever played me. River City Girls? I haven't. No, but I've heard good things about yeah, that. Yeah, that one's excellent. PlayStation Plus uh, Premium Deluxe, whatever the hell they're going to call it. I'm going to still call it Spartacus because that's way cooler. <laughs> yeah, it is. It <laughs> is cool. Why didn't Spartacus they just call well? it that? Because they're idiots. I don't know. Yeah. PlayStation Spartacus will have a uh, new selection of games. Uh, they dropped a new selection. I'm going to start over. PlayStation Spartacus dropped a whole big list of games playstation are, plus premium deluxe plan or whatever it's called yeah yeah uh, uh, i'm doing the jerk a, off motion yeah. uh, <laughs> they dropped a bunch of titles that are going to be available uh, i think june 13th is when it launches okay um everything from there's a is it 18 dollars for the premium right uh it was in my notes from the last news segment i don't know if i still have those on here yeah, I think it was eighteen bucks, but yeah, they 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 announced the list finally. Yeah, and it's got some solid stuff on there. Um, Bloodborne, the Death Otherwise Stranding, Demon Souls, Ghost of Tsushima, God of War. Uh, they got Death Stranding. Yep, Horizon Zero Dawn, Spider Man, Miles Morales, yeah. Shadow of the Colossus, uh, mm. classic games catalog. It's uh, I love they are going to be uh, apparently improving the frame rates and higher resolution for some of the classic games they said, but they didn't specify which ones. But a nice little tidbit that I did find very interesting is that some of the older games are now going to have trophies. Um, oh, Ben Studios released screenshots from for trophies from the game Siphon Filter. For Siphon Filter, yeah, for okay. two thousand one. I don't. I, it's got to be around there because yeah. I think it was close to release, or was that like X Squad or something? Yeah, I remember playing it when I rented it from Family Video sure. a million years ago. Hmm. But yeah. adding trophies to classic games will definitely incentivize people who have never played them to go back and play them. Yeah, I think that's okay as long as they're thoughtful. Yeah. Well. I'm a big trophy slut, so I'm going to go get them. <laughs> I actually feel that, like, when... Because I play retro games mainly, mm-hmm. be in a lot of them I've played before, so when there is extra functionality in games that I'm revisiting as a mm-hmm. fan of the game, it's always, like, a nice touch. You know, like, just, like, not necessarily achievements, because I think beyond... which Achievements are fun, but beyond achievements adding like level remixes and stuff or any like thing that's optional that you can click on as a fan of the game that you just want to explore further. Yeah. You know it, I mean? it encourages playing the game in ways you wouldn't too. Like there'll be achievements use this weapon, which I only would use, you know, a specific weapon. Otherwise, right. yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Achievements can be great to uh, encourage multiple play styles mm-hmm. or to explore the game. Sometimes they are just mean and dumb. <laughs> yeah. Go imagine. collect, go kill all these fucking Odin Ravens. Yeah. <laughs> mean. Dumb. Collect these Riddler trophies for two and a half years. Two and a half years. It's <laughs> <laughs> like three thousand of them. Um, yeah, they have. They haven't put, set a whole bunch of PlayStation One. I don't see any PS2 games on this list that I'm looking at now. Uh, I read somewhere that they're still working on uh, securing copyright for some of these older games, yeah, and they've they, been hesitant to drop any information about the really the PlayStation One and some PlayStation hmm. Two titles because yeah. legally, I don't think they can yet. The PS1 games are not great. Really, uh, Ape Escape, Hot Shots, Golf. Ape Escape is a very no, it, good. Video. It's great, but like as far as the, the, the entire totality list, of this list, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Jumping Flash, mm. Super Stardust, portable for the PSP. Mister oh. Driller, Tekken Two, Worms Armageddon. Like there's, there's some, there's a lot of bangers on the PS One, and they don't have a lot of bangers here. I was yeah. really disappointed I didn't see Jet Moto. Yeah. Jet Moto. I mean, I know Crash Bandicoot might be. T- I don't know. That, like, why I don't can't it? have it anymore? Remember? Yeah. Well, yeah. the, I'm sure they'll put the the remastered trilogy on the 
yeah on the spartacus yeah. subscription <laughs> service at some point dark I cloud think, dark cloud 2 jack 2 jack 3 jack x combat racing rogue galaxy wild arms 3 i was surprised not to see any of the old final fantasy games well once they buy square they can start putting those on which is the rumored acquisition yeah yeah um, speaking of acquisitions, uh, EA's trying real hard to merge or sell. That that was announced like today or yesterday, right? Yeah, I'm kind of jumping ahead of my notes here because segues are fun. Yeah. Um, a deal with NBC Universal was close until it fizzled out in April, according to Puck News, which I didn't even know they covered video games. But I've never even heard of Puck News. Is that a hockey site? No, it's like politics. <laughs> it was some, I think it's a right wing uh Oh, lovely publication, but mm-hmm. they have a media guy who, and apparently this is media, so yeah. he covered it. But yeah, they almost struck a deal with NBC Universal, who is owned by Comcast. And honestly, if EA was bought by Comcast, huh. I'm pretty sure it's a hundred percent proof that God has abandoned us. Because yeah, it's just the that's vortex a match has made begun. In hell. <laughs> well, I heard EA lost FIFA. Uh, they, they changed did. the name, yeah. Well, that's because they lost like the FIFA license. That was they're yeah, gonna last be make- week, right? That was big news. That was big, yeah. yeah. And um, they're just going to have it be like a different soccer title for what it is now, but they don't it's have to be called like soccer football club or something like yeah. that. It's stupid. M- MIFA. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, w- wink, not it's, FIFA. Yeah. <laughs> International Saco. <laughs> <laughs> Footy. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad they're losing their license. They need to lose their NFL license so we can get another NFL 2K game because that was great. I but, want like an yeah, NFL I, blitz. I mean, I want a real simulation fun. style football game, not arcadey, glitchy, Madden mess. Well, and they've been phoning it in. I think realistic sports simulators have not been great in a long time because they just put in the new roster, change everything with the number for the year, and then otherwise it's mostly the exact same game. Which yeah. that's uh, that's well documented at this point. Yeah. The industry, and I think the, there is some statistic that every time that they put out a new roster, it guarantees a forty percent turnaround on their like investment. So it just takes the minimal amount of work to do those updates and then to ship a product to, to and they will make money and they will make money because people will buy it. Yeah. And that's, I mean the competitive scene in some of those games, plus the the predatory uh, microtransactions of getting those cards so you can have your online teams. Oh, I play 2k and Oh no, I, I like 2k cause I really like basketball and I got it for the PlayStation five. So the jump to next gen and the new game felt like a new game. Yeah. It handles a lot better. I feel like the AI is a lot better, but as soon as you load in, the first thing you see is an advertisement for their VC, their virtual coin or for their ultimate my I team or whatever. I hate it. Fucking loot boxes. I just want to play it. my career and yeah. grind out my VC yeah. and yeah. upgrade. But um, yeah, EA is looking to merge or sell and now they're looking towards Disney for a deal. Somebody buy us, please. Um, <laughs> they want something more meaning, a more meaningful relationship than just licensing, licensing deals is what no, they EA's they said. want they want the right money and they want the right deal. That's all they fucking care about. They're not no. gonna, they're not going to care about the games they make. They're they haven't cared about the games. Yeah, the do yeah. they care about the games shit. they make currently? Yeah. No. Well, it's it's <laughs> so funny. Disney has such a wonderful roster of things that they could work from and developers who would be so happy to maybe make games based on their properties and do it justice, but they're just. There were what? What is it now? They have they do have a publishing suite, and it's like Disney Interactive or something like that. And Disney's got a games division. They've yeah, but consumer products. What's the last thing they put out. And, well, yeah, I, I could. Well, they kind of they just license. They pub- yeah, I was going to say they publish yeah. things, yeah. So, which means they license their properties. Yeah, and they which just is open. where the money is for them because the, Disney starting a game studio would basically just being like pouring money into like. Yeah, a lot of risks, but yeah. they, they'll let somebody else it. take. They'll t- let someone else take the risk and make the money off of them. Exactly, yeah. that's yeah. what their game is at this point, and that's what the entire like AAA games industry is at the moment, really, because all of the work is outsourced. It's purchased at a lower wage, and then it's like cycled up so that it can be, you know, sold at a premium. I guess. I don't know. Um. Yeah, so uh, Gotham Knights now will no longer be on PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. It's going to be strictly uh, next-gen oh. um, to provide players with the best possible gameplay experience was the really the only reason. But they also dropped a 13-minute gameplay video um, okay. of the game where you, they show you as Nightwing and oh. Red Hood just beating the shit out of some dudes. I watched it. Can you like kill them with your guns? No, they made a point that... 
Red Hood doesn't want to kill people. Anymore. They're non-lethal bullets, but I did watch <sighs> Nightwing kick a guy off a roof, and I'm pretty sure he that would have killed him. Yeah, well, um, game set to come out October 25th because it's been delayed. But I think this is great for the game because from what I saw in the gameplay trailer, it looks like a lot of fun. I feel like it doesn't look as pretty as I wanted it to look for a next gen game, but. Mm. After seeing what happened to Cyberpunk and like Halo Infinite having that stagnant release because of a lack of launch content, I think it's a good move to yeah, just kind of focus everything up on the next gen. Yeah, let's just make sure that this works, put it on the next gen, and don't run into a scenario like CD Projekt Red or uh, Smart. Yeah, you know, how do you feel about it. this, Dylan? About Gotham Knights? <laughs> Not about the game. About the, the, the fact the, that the, they're finally making the transition. Yeah. So this is uh, hopefully like the first of many that are going to start transitioning to just next gen. I'm okay with it now that I actually have one of these systems. <laughs> Same. <laughs> Same. And that's the, but that's like, but that's also <sighs> me being like a little bit selfish in terms of that. I think it's still, I don't think it's acceptable really when you don't have these things in people's hands and it's been over two years now. It's just, I, I don't think it's, I, I think they made the calculated decision because they knew they can get away with it money wise because the, obviously they had analysts on this pretty much from day one. Yeah. You have to imagine because if you want to develop for next gen hardware, you develop for next gen hardware. You don't stick with the other shit. Um, and, and that deal that Microsoft said, that one where they said, well, uh, the first year is strictly both Xbox One and then Xbox Series X. And yeah. S. And they kind of, they fulfilled their, you know, I guess it's time, but it's still a little frustrating. I feel bad for people who won't be able to play this and maybe even pre-ordered it. Yeah. I mean, there, there are a lot of people that don't have the next trend systems that are just Batman fans and they, they don't want to spend $600 to find a new PS5, but yeah. Also, I have the new systems and I want things to look better and to not be designed around old hardware. Yes. And I also have a, I have a suspicion that it would be easier to to reduce the the capability of the game to to port it down to the PS4 than it would be to port it up. Cuz I feel like that's maybe what they ran into at Cyberpunk at what as well because they were looking to launch on both platforms. Why wouldn't you just focus on one if it's a you know ideally if it's two years into the console lifespan which we could argue if it is because is it day one is it probably day one for somebody who doesn't it just got theirs you know what i mean it honestly feels sometimes like we're still in the prototype phase of all of this right and i think that it's i think that it's implied kind of around the industry that this generation is going to be probably the longest generation we've ever had in video games, unless Microsoft starts doing what they did this generation and starts releasing like um, Xbox, well, mul- Xbox mul- One X, multiple iterations. The PlayStation Four had three different iterations as well. Yeah, but like performance-wise, the Xbox from Xbox One to Xbox One X is pretty significant. Um, the Xbox, the, boost. the Xbox One to Xbox One X, not the Xbox Series X. Yes, see, I, correct, I, Mundo. Yeah, I've gone cross-eyed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's and I had to get that right in my head, so my like my speech slowed down. And, and like, oh. I don't know. I mean, that model makes sense for uh, console releases to an extent because uh, it's kind of just updating like a computer. It's like we just have some new, better hardware, but it's still the games are roughly the same. They just look and play a little better on one. I don't know. It makes sense. Well, it makes sense to me. But I, if you're going to make a game that needs to be playable on the Series X and the PlayStation 5 and potentially the Nintendo Switch, just getting it to work on those three is tough enough. I remember when Mighty Number no. 9 was getting kickstarted and they're like, we're, we're on this, we're on the Vita, we're going to be on the fucking Game Boy Color. It's like, just calm down. going to put just, it on your fridge. It's on your fridge. It's on your phone. <laughs> it's in the game. It's on a pregnancy <laughs> test. <laughs> it's got blast processing. <laughs> it's it's a. Uh, I just think it's. I I don't know. I, it's also up in the air, and the way that game development happens now, the, the amount of detail you have to put into these games in order for them to even be like shippable and um, for people to be excited about them. Like, there's nothing. There's nothing not complicated about it. And if these things take years to make, and they're it's only taking longer. It's not get, it's not slowing down. Right. They haven't figured out a way to like quantum compute half of this stuff. Once that happens, right. video games will start coming out 
pretty damn quick because you can just start using assets and plug them into places and whatsoever. I, I read a whole article about theoretically, that. yeah, theoretically, and uh, it, and it seems to me like if they could just they the hardware is going to far exceed the software. Yeah. It already these has, things happen. Kind of. Even now with these games. We yeah. were struggling to like, you know, and the, the, the budgets have inflated to, to fill up content for these platforms that yeah. are able to do so much that it's like, where do the budgets come from to fill out, you know, a, a game that's got, I don't even know what the budgets are at. They're insane. They're insane. Astronomical. And They're astronomical, but it's in, it's like the, the, the risk reward uh, ratio has changed, so it's harder to yeah. make a game that's truly revolutionary because you can't spend two hundred billion dollars no. on a, a risk. Starfield got delayed by Bethesda as well, and uh, it is a, a risk a risk reward thing where you have so much money, and this is a new IP, yeah. and if you release it early like Cyberpunk, and it is Bethesda is notorious for glitchy, buggy messes sometimes, yeah. mm-hmm. and you do want to take the time and uh, put the right foot forward because a bad impression will scare people away from a game. I don't know if that's true because early access is becoming more and more popular as time goes on. Uh, is it popular or just prevalent? It's prevalent still, though. Is it, It's like it pre, it, if it's prevalent first, then it becomes popular because people don't want to have the FOMO of being left out. So yeah. it's like now if it's around and people know that they can see a game early, maybe I'm going to be a fan. If I'm not a fan, I'm out there day one. Am I really a fan? Like, so like, everybody's kind of scrambling to figure out like how we can turn oh, turn yeah. audience into beta testers. And it's like, yeah, it's your job as a developer to make a game that works. <laughs> and <laughs> that's if, if we're talking because if you're talking from pure artistry, yeah, I think that's absolutely true. I don't think the world, yeah, I, I still don't think the world will ever approach, it's going to be a long while still until people approach art, video games like art. I just don't think that's something that people do. Oh, I think on the, it depends on the scale. When yeah. you're talking about AAA games, you're talking about a scale that like not one artist can make a huge difference on that mm. canvas, you yeah. know. As far but as if you're talking about Atari, like doing a 2600 mm. game, you got full reign of what's going to happen, you mm. know. And smaller projects, indie mm. games yes. strive for art, but exactly. as far as AAA titles, that achieve a major artistic accomplishment. I mean, Death Stranding st- stands out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as far as a tour there doing like firing on all cylinders kind of thing. As far yeah. as a single a Yoko, auteur, a Yoko Taro type of person, Yeah. Like know. video game creators as our auteurs in AAA in the AAA realm is incredibly difficult because yeah. it's very risky. Extremely risky. And it's the same reason though like when the MCU machine lets Taika Waititi have some fun, it's going to make one of the most like uh, the best visions for a film because it's a unique take and it's got a singular humor and approach to it and more of an identity, which I don't know. It is. It's just, yeah. Well, it's kind of it's Gotham Knights is going to be fucking just tested to shit. There will be nothing that'll be offensive. It'll be something that like it's nothing, palatable. Yeah. And yeah, it's going to be, yeah. it's going to be like the most bland cereal. It's like, it'll keep, get you through the day, but it's not cinnamon. It'll be crunch. white, some white bread, but you know, if you toast it, it's crispy. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, <laughs> no, if it, if, it, if it's got that one little bit that can yeah. like really cement it and pull it back in. Like, I mean, even look at like Halo Infinite with just the ad- addition of that grappling shot. There's no sex in the game. Yeah. <laughs> Why would I play it? He doesn't even have sex I with a prisoner. As a fan of the TV show, I the cannot relate to this yeah. game. How do you get a boner in that <laughs> in that armor? It'd be uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, I would. I'd like to think that they they probably designed around that. I mean, they made a helmet that can, like you said, survive. I would imagine he. I would space. imagine he's asexual. I don't know. Did, well, like I mean, they bred it out of him or something. His bones are actually unbreakable. They go in and there's a surgery that like grafts this like unbreakable metal to every bone, and only like fifty percent of the kids survive it when they go through it. Oh, and there's a there's such a good gnarly sci-fi story in gold, the Halo universe, gold. and they're just like CWing the fuck out of him. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> they Wolverine him. Um, yeah, I got a couple more things up here. Sure. Uh, Elden Ring has sold more copies than Call Call of Duty Vanguard, which I. I know Vanguard's not doing very well, but for Elden Ring is, to to do it in two months, shipped thirteen point four million copies. Yeah, and is that because Call Vanguard. of Duty is tired. 
I, think I feel like an that. Elden Ring is a phenomenon because yeah. we were talking about before iterations of FIFA and uh, NFL games uh, with Madden games. I mean, that's the same thing now with Call of Duty. Every season they've got a new iteration on it. That's kind of this. They just keep forcing you to buy the same thing over and over. Well, yeah. they're afraid. They're afraid of losing relevancy in such a way that I don't think I don't think people really understand how. If you're like a fan of one of these things, like even like Titanfall 2, which grossly underperformed, but is an absolutely brilliant game, including yeah, the Titanfall's multiplayer. Yeah, really good. And it, that, but that's an example of like they can milk their hardcore fans if they want to. They can keep they can keep up this process if they really want to make this like a live service game. But they're also afraid because they're still running in the 2010s model of like if we don't keep making these nobody's going to be talking about us. If, if the train stops moving. When, when, if, if, if once you're on the they, train, it's hard to get out. Well, they, they, be, they believe that you stop being relevant yeah. the moment that you're not on social media and people aren't reviewing your games or talking about them as think pieces. Yeah. When the truth is actually, once the heat dies down, people are just living their lives and playing these things. Call of Duty is not to the freemium model yet, but I think it will be. Um, well, Warzone. Is it is that freemium? Warzone's freemium, yeah. Yeah, but it's also a mega download that most people don't have space for or are willing to make people, space for. People do it anyway. It's crazy that but it was it, big during the pandemic. Yeah. The that, trick is to get people to download it once. They're like, I don't want to re-download this stuff. Yeah, because yeah. it's fucking huge. Now I just have a Call of Duty machine. Yeah. Um, they're not making a Call of Duty game next year. It's taking a year off, which okay. I thought was Smart. a good move. Maybe they can reinvigorate I, I reinvigorate. I I, franchise i don't i mean they're not gonna get the masses back in at this point they, i can't imagine them doing something transformative enough that would make people that haven't been playing it like we gotta check out call of duty yeah <laughs> have you guys heard of this call of duty game just yeah. the fact that elden ring has been able to get in so many gamers who aren't souls yeah. players is insane uh, the number of people that have jumped onto that it is uh one of the first truly next gen experiences even though it is on other other ones but yeah, I played them both ways, and yeah. I'll tell you what, playing it on a Series X, oof, Yeah, on the PS5, own. it is a chef's kiss. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yep. Um, the Switch is selling a lot of fucking units, despite a chips shortage. Um, from last April to this past March, Nintendo has sold 23 million consoles, a 20% drop from last year. But with that makes COVID mm-hmm. and the chip shortage, I still think that's pretty baller. Um the number that number though is tallied across all three iterations of the switch um it still counts still counts by the end of 2021 microsoft sold an estimated 12 million uh xbox uh what is the name of the new one series series x X. and series s yeah and sony sold an estimated 17 million playstation 5 so the switch is outselling uh microsoft and sony they will they will always yeah, they're they're playing a different game, and they're yeah. playing a, a game that, uh, I mean, they have and they, killer licenses, and I mean, they're doing some strange, weird portable shit. Like it's fun. It's yeah, I only use in. my Switch as a portable. Like I just sit on the couch and, and play yeah. it, and I haven't had a portable in so long that it feels really good. Yeah, to, to just have one like that, and it's wonderful. Yeah, it's and such I a unique piece of hardware, just like popping out Joy Cons and stuff. totally. Well, and it's I, I I often cite it as my favorite console of all time oh. by this point. And they haven't even released that new four. What is it? Four K Pro or whatever the oh the new they're one just going to make a they're going to make a sequel. It's not even going to be the Switch. It's going to be something else. Yeah, and I think that like. The size of a lot of the game, like the the catalog of games that they have available on their eShop and stuff, makes it a lot more approachable for a lot more people. Yeah, you know, there's some tr- there's some it's real hard. garbage on there. Though. It's hard you know what? To be like, I've got like 20 hours in my week for like hobby activity to like think. Well, a PlayStation Five is going to be perfect just to fill that little spot where mm-hmm. I need to like a thirty minutes a night or something. Like you, it, it requires a lot more dedication in, in that library. I feel, yeah. uh, and I don't think that that's a bad thing at all. But it's definitely a, a different market that Nintendo has always recognized. Right. That like you know, video games can be both things. You you know what's great? Entertainment above all else. Every parent in the world understands a Nintendo and Mario, and that's like a great system for their kids. Oh, they can take it in the car. They can play it at home. Uh, It's 
got everything that a lot of parents would want to get for their kids. Mm -hmm. And also it's just got the hardcore gamers and just like the casual gamers that are older too. It's, it's really utilitarian. Uh, this, yeah. So the switch has sold 107.65 million units as, <sighs> as of May 10th, it was announced and it is the fifth best selling game console of all time. Here's a question. How much of that is due to the fact that it's a portable system? I think that, that like plays a into it a lot. Now like that was a big selling Game point. Boy My house, I've got a household of three, and now we have two switches. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it's like, it's also like, if, if we had a PlayStation 5, I doubt that we would have two. No. You know what I mean? Like, that's not something that, that absolutely wild, first would of all. Do. If you've Unless got a family tough. of four yeah. or five, it's not unheard of to have two switches in, in any house. No. Yeah. Well, if you have two kids that each want to switch, exactly. they can both play the games, exactly. like the, the hard one, hard, uh, hardware, and but... If the, parents like video games who this generation have grew up with a nintendo mm-hmm. well it's like then you've got three or four switches in the house it's true and it's like nintendo keeps on selling because everybody in the family needs one whereas the wii you've got one in the living room or whatever and that was the best-selling console previously is that right no um playstation well, 2 right? oh it was a two yeah okay. well the, uh, of the four consoles that have sold more than the switch two of them are handhelds nintendo handhelds the mm-hmm. ds and the game boy okay um, and then the other two consoles that sold more than the Switch, uh, PS2 and PS4. So, I mean, it, it, it is partially that it's portable, and it's, I think Nintendo just know what knows what they're doing until yeah. they don't. Well, they're also <laughs> starting to bring over, like, because I've never really been a Nintendo guy. Yeah. I mean, I my first console ever was an N64. I do like Nintendo, but mm-hmm. I jumped to Sony pretty fast. Um and my brother has a Switch, and I've played his a little bit, and I do really enjoy it. Mario Kart's my shit. Yeah. Um, but they're starting to port over some of the games that, you know, like Alan Wake is going to be on the Switch, apparently. Everything will be on the Switch eventually. eventually. It's pretty, like, yeah. I'm seeing more and more games that I've played being ported over, and, like, they got Civilization on there now. It just seems yeah. like their catalog keeps Final growing. Final Fantasy has just put all yeah. of them on there. I've been eyeing up the Dark Souls uh on switch because i've never played that it's like i'd like to it's actually quite good i'd like to it approach well. some of those games and it's like because i've only got one modern system as like a pretty dedicated retro gamer to see any of those stuff like it's gonna I, i'm not gonna buy another console to play the first dark souls or whatever no. but if it's on my switch like i will try that sometime you can borrow it from me if you want i own it physical oh nice yeah yeah i mean i would definitely put in some time with that because it seems appealing. I don't necessarily play those type of modern games, but I think you that might appreciate. It's got a retro a Souls game. It's got a retro design to it in a way. It is Ninja very Gaiden much a Castlevania fan. in oh, yeah. a lot of ways. It, it, it approaches it difficulty a in a way that is reminiscent of older games. Yes. Yeah, and I with more reward that. for the death. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. Yeah, Switch rocks. Yeah, we love the Switch. Um, we Switch simps. We mentioned already Starfield is going to be delayed until the first half of 2023. Yeah. Okay. Um, Good. Fine. Yeah. Yep. Cool with that. I was kind of shocked to find out that that's, I didn't realize that's Bethesda's first new IP in over 20 years. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Get to work. But that's amazing. <laughs> that's crazy. Mm. Um, Which goes back to what we were saying before. I'm surprised they haven't announced a Sky, another Skyrim remake yet. Yeah. I'm just waiting for that final entry in the Wolfenstein reboot series i need it i need it bad were those good oh i love those games i i will go to bat for the wolfenstein reboots yeah absolutely Uh, yeah i played a lot of wolfenstein as a kid 3d just the original oh sure i have it on the game boy i'm still like it still kind of hits a sweet spot for me and i'd my Leben. <laughs> <laughs> That's the spot I'm talking about. <laughs> well, and uh, Bethesda, they haven't made like a science fiction space game like ever, right? That's like a newer territory for them no, since like yeah. way back in the day. Yeah. yeah. Um, they have fallout but that's more that's post-apocalyptic a, and yeah that's got some futuristic got some elements. Sci-fi elements yeah yeah. Uh, yeah that's legitimate science fiction but, but not yeah, like, like outer space, space yeah, opera yeah, yeah. yeah and there aren't a lot of alien stuff in there yeah. you know yeah uh, one of the reasons i read that they delayed it was to avoid crunch which is always a good thing when they can get it and i you think, know what they're actually doing they're gonna fucking crunch for an extra year is what yeah. they're gonna do I, well we're avoiding crunch those people are not eating or sleeping right <laughs> no they are not i can um, almost promise you I think that they delayed it and I think it's a good move because since they've been bought by Microsoft and this being a new IP coming out, they really want to knock it out of the park. 
And I honestly hope they do because I would love an, an honest to God sci sci fi space. Buddy, I game. hate to tell you, you're gonna <laughs> have to get a Series X. I planned on it eventually. Well, also, when when this comes out, uh, just know that you don't have to buy it right away because they will re release it over the next ten years once a year. Oh yeah, so yeah, they will. It'll eventually be on every system. Starfield, if will. it's good, yeah. Well, because it will. Fallout Fallout Four has not had a bunch of yeah. crud. Yeah, thrown around. That, and that's probably why, like, it's just, close to the age where it could be remastered because it is about the age that Skyrim was when it was remastered. I'm surprised oh, man, they haven't just me, they haven't. My mind. I'm surprised they haven't re-released Oblivion. Like, uh, just pretty. Oh, the, I think they're a little embarrassed by Obliv- Oblivion, but I actually think Oblivion plays a little bit better than Skyrim. So. Oblivion's got that charm that you can only find. Charm, yeah, 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 early 360. Stop criminal scum. Like I liked that I could just literally jump from place to place in my acrobatics or was it, it the it acrobatics up, skill. I'm like, eventually I'm you could hopping. run on water. Yep. Yeah. It's the best. Um one last little news thing here that I just thought was absolutely mind bottle boggling. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um a streamer has beaten all twelve mainline Assassin's Creed games without taking any damage. Wow. I don't like that. He played in the highest <laughs> He played on the highest difficulty, Sounds starting strong. at Origin, because I think that's the first one that lets you choose. Chronologically? Okay. That's no, a- that's the first one that lets you choose the difficulty. So he, wants he started start at one first. and oh. played. Once he got to Origin, he started at the hardest difficulty. All levels had to be 100% synchronized with no restarting if he got hit. Or failed a single objective, he would start the entire run over. I, this sounds sadistic, and uh, I don't want to watch anyone do this. I'm, this sounds good like for you if this is your thing. Done, but it just makes you sound mentally ill. Hopefully, he's making a lot of money streaming this. Yeah, could I would you imagine, imagine getting halfway through Syndicate and then getting hit by one of those stupid little policemen, and then being that like, a big "I have game. to go all the way back to Assassin's Creed Altair." That like he, he must guy? be the master of the shitty um, glitches and gameplay errors. He, he, imagine how many times you accidentally ran up something, or like you just didn't do the maneuver you thought you did. Well, yeah, I, I'm just not impressed that he didn't do it with a Guitar Hero controller. Yeah, <laughs> this dude's a he's a hack. He's a hack. Beat it with a p- dance pad. Yeah, yeah, or the Donkey Konga controllers. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Call me when you beat it with that uh, that DJ controller for DJ Hero, and there then I'll be go. impressed. Yeah. I'm in. Well, uh, that was the news. That was news. We're going to hear from some of the other amazing shows from the HyperX Podcast Network, and we're going to be back to talk about what we've been playing, as well as games that we can't stop thinking about. Absolutely. Explode When Defeated presents something really neat and full of meat. Those children aren't going to protect themselves in a brand new podcast series about everyone's favorite giant reptile. Godzilla? No, we already did that one. Rodan? No, uh, we did that one too. Gorgo? Gamera. We're talking about Gamera. From turtles to medieval samurai golems on our new series, Demolition Die. Only on the HyperX Podcast Network. Us. We're the Spirit Hunters, and we're a show that treats Hunter Hunter and Yu Hakusho's author as the center of the universe. Some weeks we do linguistic analysis. The Chinese meaning of this character is to smelt or refine, but so the changed meaning in Japanese it means to temper. Other times, we get absolutely smashed. So we take one shot every time. Yusuke uses the ray gun. One hour later. This is the least coherent episode. Oh, I'm Sarah, you I think you're firing this <laughs> Check us out at the HyperX Podcast Network. Make room for huge plays with the HyperX Alloy Origin 65 mechanical gaming keyboard and the Pulsefire Haste wireless mouse. The Alloy Origin 65 has a functionally compact form factor, keeping the arrow keys while ditching the numpad and the F keys. The Pulsefire Haste is the lightest wireless mouse from HyperX, featuring a robust connection and the precision you need to click heads. The Alloy Origin 65 and Pulsefire Haste wireless, a terrific twosome to keep your setup clean and clutter free. And we're back, everybody. We back. We talking now about what we've been playing, Absolutely. and surprisingly, it's not just Elden Ring right now. Yeah, for yeah. me, anyways. Yeah, you know, uh, who wants to go first? Uh, Let's hear from Tyler. Yeah, no, I got. I've been playing a lot of games. Uh, I got NBA Two K Twenty Two, as I mentioned earlier, because it's the NBA playoffs, and I got that itch to dunk on some fools. So I've been playing that, and it's good. I, yeah, I like it a lot. I made my character uh, look like Bob Ross. 
Okay. Uh, okay. And uh, his Twitter handle is I go hard in the paint. Because you make Twitter handles in this game. Yep. You, I also made a diss track against the game, the rapper. What? And I did a fashion walk. So it's a very bizarre game. Wow. I think uh, I'm into this. <laughs> what the heck? Can you skip the sports part and just play? You probably. Yeah. Yeah. You legitimately could I never I would, play a game. Oh, wow. I think if this could be my life, that would be like, I'm a pro athlete. <laughs> I've been playing that. I got, uh, obviously, Elden Ring. And then the free PlayStation game of the month, Curse of the Dead Gods, is an absolute blast. You really liked that one? I like it a lot. What, okay. what's, what is it about? Um, it's like you, uh, you enter this temple and there's, I think three, four, five, six, seven, like eight temples. It's you much like beat. a Hades. Yeah. In a lot of ways. So top down view. Um, Isometric. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it's designed for you to die several times and carry buffs with you into the next life. So you just kind of like figure out how to beat certain enemies and then you end up eventually dying because they have this whole corruption scale yeah. to the game, too, where every time you enter a new room, you become more corrupted, and then corruptions lead to curses, and then they'll start taking away abilities. And it's a pretty simple game, but it's a roguelike, I believe. Did you say that? Uh-uh. Okay. It is a roguelike, essentially. It's it's just building upon what you've done before. Yeah, but it looks pretty, and it, does look pretty. it plays really nice. Once you get a handle on how to do the different attacks and the parries and the dodges... Sometimes I feel really powerful. Yeah. <laughs> and then other times I get hit by a tornado and I'm like, well, that's that. Mm. Yeah. Cool. That sounds like a f- good game. You, you're not as hot on it, though, Dylan? I played it for about maybe three hours on a whim because it's on Game Pass. Mm. Uh, so obviously I tried it. But I, I thought it was all right. I just it, I knew it wasn't going to like stick with me in a strange way. So I don't know. I do like it makes me feel competitive because I get really close to beating a boss, but I just don't have enough uh, like skill points or buffs yet to yeah. beat them. So I'm like, all right, one more run, yeah, one more run. And then I beat the temple and then I'm like, what's that next temple about though? And then one more run. So it is addicting. rather addicting. Yeah. One more day in Stardew. <laughs> That's Any, any, anything like. else you've been yeah. playing? Uh, well, I got FIFA. Haven't played that too much yet. And, really fighting off the urge to not replay ghost uh, ghost of uh shushima because my, both of my roommates are currently playing it and you're, oh. you're never going to be able to beat elden ring right you've just given up no i actually was playing elden ring this morning okay hmm. back on my my spell sword build so i'm back in the saddle i i took a, a small break from it and i was playing it yesterday <laughs> and i was using the wrong controller in my head because i was mm. playing a different game and I went up to Bach and almost beat the shit out of him trying to talk to him. I took a big swing and I missed his head. I was like, sorry, dude. Uh, <laughs> trying to say hi. <laughs> and that game will punish you. Your game from then on has a dead Bach. Yep. Yep. It's true. Wow. It's kind of like my game. Yeah. <laughs> he he, uh, he evolved into a, a dead Bach. Yep. He's a vegetable. Yeah. But he's a pretty vegetable. No, he looks like an idiot. He's wearing a stupid hat. And he just well, sits like there. a carrot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> stupid vegetable. A pretty vegetable. <laughs> it's a nice vegetable. I don't know. I think carrots are very emotionally uh, aesthetically attractive. Pleasing. I don't know. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, I love sure. carrots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, carrots are great. And a little bit of hummus, you know. Controversial. Oof. Brad, what have you been playing? Uh, I actually uh, beat a game over the last week called Ayudin Chronicle Rising. It okay. is the prequel to Ayudin Chronicle, which is coming out. I think later this year. Is that, it actually coming out later this year? I believe so. It might be early next year. They haven't like hammered down a date, I don't think. But don't it's shit. from the creator of the Sui Coden series for the PS1. Mm-hmm. Uh, big fan. Those are some of my favorite games of all time. There's literally a poster right behind you. Yep. That I constantly look at because I love that art style. Yeah, it looks great. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is the prequel game. This isn't made by uh, the company that is making Ayudin Chronicle. I think it's Rabbit and Bear. It's not made by them. It's made by another company, but it's got characters that will be in the new game, mm. not the main ones, but it, uh, it's got a cool story. It's got great dialogue. It's well-written. The gameplay is lacking. Uh, when there's, there's no difficulty. It's like a dungeon crawler, and you play as three different characters, and you're trying to like solve a mystery about what's going on with this village, and you just keep going and doing little missions and going back into these dungeons, and I enjoyed my time with it. But there was no difficulty, and really? I've gotten to the point where that's frustrating. And then at the end, you can turn on hard mode, which it's not making the game 
like fun difficult. It's just everything kills you in one hit. I'm like, that's not, you're not ramping up a difficulty right. there. You're just, yeah. you're just uh, making it harder to kill enemies and making it easier for enemies to kill you. It's not improving yeah. the gameplay. It's just making it even worse in a way. Interesting. Yeah. The, the gameplay needs to be built into it, but I, I beat the game and I, wouldn't recommend it unless you are going to be playing Ayuden Chronicle, the main game. Well, then I might because I am going to be playing Ayuden Chronicles because we're going to have to talk about it on this podcast no matter what. And I like Suikoden, so. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited for that game to come out. But I beat that. And then getting ready for Indie Games Month in July, hmm. I put in Disco Elysium. I have the disc and I put it in and instead it needed to download an update. So I played Hades instead <laughs> and I played one run. I beat my dad. And then I was like, I'll, I'll just do one more. And then I played for three hours. So, because <laughs> yep. Hades is fucking good. That is such a good video game. Yeah, I was surprised I was able to jump back in and beat him right away. You might like Hades too. That's yes. one that that's one that really kind of vibes, and it runs so well on the Switch. So, oh, that's good. it was on sale for the Switch the other day. It might still be. I almost is that bought the Diablo it. Diablo series, or is it similar? It kind of it has that per- perspective, okay. the isometric side perspective. Gotcha. Um, but it is very arcadey. It's okay. a lot of movement and not precision. I wouldn't call it precision. A lot of crowd control. Nice. Yeah. It's fun. Like that. Yeah. That Super and, Giant are very good developers. Yeah. Nice. I played some Elden Ring as well. Yeah. Good stuff. Nice. Yeah. How about you, D-Man? I haven't played anything new. I hate to disappoint everyone. I can't think of a single thing. I honestly can't. You play anything? Even I old? played Elden Ring. Yeah, but that's it. Like, that's all I thought to play. I played some Red Dead Two, I guess, but I'm having trouble getting back into it. I bought it on a whim because it is 4K enhanced, and I wanted just a pretty game that I could pretend to be a cowboy dying of influenza. Sorry, spoiler. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know that. It's Oregon Trail. <laughs> you, you have you guys played the game? Oh, I beat it. Several times. I've never played a Red Dead game. You would maybe like. I, I don't like having the flu though, so I'll probably avoid it. Yeah. Well, yeah. the, the way this story on trail, I died of many dysenteries. <laughs> I, th- yes. I think I, I think <laughs> all I'm, the dysenteries, I, and I shot every squirrel, not for the meat, but for the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I think what really impresses me about this game is that this game is going to become like a real like relic to what video games were in that exact moment, 2018. There's. It is such an achievement of video game storytelling that they kind of forget to do everything else that the game should do. It's kind of interesting in the way that they're like, yeah, go here and do this. Like most video games make you do kill this many people can do that. But along the line, there's just something that's not clicking. And I love this game to death. Like it's a very good video game, but I'm also just like, okay, well, they really want you to role play this. They want you to walk around very slowly around your camp and you're just going to stand next to a person for a little while and kind of be like, Oh, okay. And then they'll have a full conversation with the person next to them. And you'll just be like, okay, yeah, cool. All right. I guess I'm really a role playing here. (laughs) And then you'll mosey on to the next place and it'll be like, Oh, okay. And they, they, they give you like decisions. You, you can upgrade your gear. You can look a certain way. You can make Arthur super fat. You can give him like the world's biggest beard, and of course I do that. Oh, yeah, yeah, my three decisions I, or a mustache. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it, it's it. They truly tried to make a sim with this. I mean, the horses shit for fuck's sake. They shit a lot. They shit a lot, <laughs> unhealthy yeah. amount. And I think the vets in this world need to take a serious look at what they're putting in the water because it is far too much horse shit. I mean, dysentery's real. Yeah, it was a different time. It was a different time, it was man. Literally. Literally. These horses are super regular. <laughs> We're talking like 15, 16, 20 times a day. Oh, yeah. How well. many horses have you been around for a full day? They probably take a lot more dumps than you think. How many times you see a horse in a parade and you're like, that just took a major dump? Yeah. Honestly, the last yeah. time I saw a horse was probably like five months ago. And it was a, it probably was outside of a Bucks game. <laughs> yeah, it was downtown. And it was not shitting. Yeah. So, But that's like a, that's like a two-minute window into my horse life. You were too busy looking into their beautiful eyes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's what it was. That's what I sensed from you. Yeah, you understand the the mysticism of a horse. <laughs> and, and, no, yeah, I, 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 and I keep finding myself like, oh, I really want to get into this, but the game does not 
there's something that about the game that does not control well. The like the it's heavy. hand feel. It's too heavy. It's very heavy. It's cl- it, it clunks around. It does. And I think that's partially on purpose. And I know this is like their magnum. I consider Red Dead Two the magnum opus of Rockstar games, mm-hmm. just because of just a pure cinematic, like what an achievement that game is. So I don't know. I'm going to keep playing it and. The game only gets better the further you go along because once you get used to the wonky controls, you kind of you slide right in. Yeah, and once yeah. you fully embrace the role playing aspect of it, yeah, and not just you, jump from thing to thing. Yeah, when you really yeah. take your time in the world, you see all the little details that they put in and just how much care was put into the game. Yeah. It's the first game that I've actually like didn't mash the sprint button to get around in a long time. Like The yeah. Witcher Three, walking through Novigrad. I think I said that right. No grad, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I walked around as Geralt and there's not even nearly as many different no. animations and things you can see in that game. But when a game makes you feel like, all right, I want to be in this world. Yeah. I want to be this character walking to wherever I'm going. I think that's pretty special. Yeah. So definitely their magnum opus. It's one of the, one of my favorite games I've played. Well, I was out record shopping uh, with a friend on my birthday weekend and I, because I had been playing Red Dead, uh, I bought the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly soundtrack on vinyl. <laughs> nice. And it's yes. such a good soundtrack. Any of Morcone. Yeah. Yes, dude. Yeah. One of the so best. It's obviously influencing my thoughts. Yeah. So, I mean, good on them. I'm going to keep playing it. I don't know. I haven't been buying a lot of games just because I'm trying to save some cash, but, you know, I'll pick up an indie here or there. Yeah. 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 How about you, Jordan? You've been playing, I'm sure, a lot of cool games that i haven't heard of yeah so i mean i play mostly retro games um but i've been kind of playing some games on my switch too um but for nintendo games well since mgc i've been playing a lot of battle toads just like yeah. every other day i'm throwing it on see how far i can get have you beaten it no, <laughs> no. I, I don't know anyone that's actually beaten it legit I've seen people do it, and I mean, it's possible. I just, like, I didn't own Battle Toads as a kid, so I just have not put in the time to get good yet. Um, I can get three or four levels in. I've gotten past the Turbo Tunnel maybe once in my life. I, just, I can't beat it with a Game Genie. Oh, really? I couldn't, you know. It's, it's, it's hard. There's yeah. no getting around that. Yeah. Um, but I've been playing that. I've been playing uh, a port of the arcade version of Berserk. To the NES? Oh, really? Yeah. So it's like, it's a 2019 port. The, what's the gameplay? It's an arcade port? Yeah. So Berserk was 1980, I think, by, uh, um, what's the, um, Stern. Wait a minute. This 1980. Is, mm-hmm. Are you talking? No. This isn't, is it based on the, is it based on the graphic novel or the manga? I don't think. So, Maybe not. Oh, it's okay. not. Okay. I, no, this is I, the, this is a, this is like a game made in Chicago. It was an arcade game. I mean, it was you, kind of based on no, Battlestar Galactica. No, it's 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 not. Yeah. Okay. It's, yeah. This is like a classic arcade game. This is a, a port to the okay. NES from 2019. It, yeah. It's it's very very simplistic. Very much not. But the cool thing is that the developer Parasoft did um, that game was one of the first arcade games that had art uh, like speech synthesis in it. So there's a robot voice like yelling at you while you're playing it. What does it say? Oh god, I don't even remember. You died. Yeah, exactly. It's like destroy all humans kind of thing. Power like, up. It, well, no, it's it's more like the it's it's trying to kill you. The voice is of the robots who are attacking you, so it's like human detected, you know, yeah, that sure. kind of thing. And uh it was it made a huge impression in the arcades in the 80s, but I've never I've never even seen one in it was made in Chicago and Stern Electronics made it, which is even stranger because sure. I feel like we got to see a lot of the Midway stuff and a lot of the Bally stuff, uh, or I'm sorry, Williams and Midway. But the Stern Electronics video games were just kind of too old, I think. But he, um, the developer that did the port, Parasoft, I got the ROM on itch.io, and basically he used the, the sample channel on the NES to do all the robot speak. Okay. So he chopped up all of the phrases, all the words that the robot says, and assembled them into like forty-two phrases or something. So it it's almost like a perfect one-to-one arcade port to the NES. Yeah. Um, and so I've just been kind of playing that as research because it's 
it's you know uh, just kind of a simple high score game yeah. um but you know one that's based on a an eight way shooting mechanic that kind of influenced Robotron and is it like a stuff. twin stick it's not but uh Eugene Jarvis invented the twin stick out of frustration while playing Berserk okay <laughs> so if you can imagine that situation have uh, you talked to Jarvis at any of the conventions I've never met him no he was, I'm a big fan he was there one or two of them that's awesome yeah interesting I mean, he's still based in Chicago, I believe. Yeah, I'm not sure. Because that's I, where Raw Thrills is still, I think. Oh, I know Next Machina was amazing. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm a big Jarvis fan. Uh, but I've been, so, so I've been playing a lot of Berserk on the NES, and then I've been playing um, All Was Awakening, which arrived yesterday, which is just totally fantastic. Uh, that was ported to the NES by Brad Smith, who did a game called Lizard, uh, which is a really bizarre Metroidvania Okay. Yes, that came out in I think 2018 or something like that. Wow. Okay. Um, Brad Smith goes by Rain Warrior, and he's like a really prolific NES developer and musician. Yeah. Um, kind of a masterful dude. Um, but All Was Awakening was made by it was an indie game made in Sweden by a game by a company called Elden Pixels, and then they released it on limited run as a cartridge. Limited run games as an NES cartridge. Oh, wow. And uh, I, I played the demo, I think, last summer, and it was really good. I think the demo is available for free, like the NES ROM. Um, on the uh, on the Switch? Uh, no, just on online. You oh, can get it the, okay. the NES ROM to play on an emulator on sure. a computer. Um, but Always Awakening is available on the Switch. Okay. Because it was a it was an indie game first. Yeah. Um, so I've been playing those two games a lot, and then I've been playing um, a game on my Switch that a friend recommended called What the Golf. I've heard about this. Which is very good. It's good? Yeah, it's very okay. good. It's a physics game based on golf made by made by people who hate golf, which is <laughs> how they describe it, right? Yeah. So it's like... Take the game of golf and the idea of trying to hit something into a hole and then throw every single rule out the window. (laughs) And then you just have like, there are courses where you're just throwing the club at the hole. (laughs) (laughs) And you know, you don't know what the rules are before you hit the first shot of the course. So it's always like a surprise and then it's a puzzle. Oh, that's, oh, that's really interesting. Cool. Yeah. yeah. I like that immediately as a concept. It is very, very cool. And I will be playing it, like laying on the floor. My my girlfriend will be watching TV and I will just be giggling. Like, and <laughs> yeah. she's like, what the hell is wrong with you? And I'm just like, I'm playing golf. <laughs> and she can't understand what's so funny about it. But I don't know, physics puzzles and Like when the nice thing about video games is that you can break the rules of things and to Mm -hmm. see physics puzzles play out in ways that you couldn't see them in other mediums is really funny. Yeah. You know, like there is a, there is a course in this game where instead of hitting a ball, it gives you a swing set and you you have to like push the swings until the swing set tumbles over. (laughs) And then you have to keep doing that until you get it to the hole. And I laughed so hard when I did that because the whole premise is so ridiculous. And there's it, you, cause you knock it over at some point and it doesn't work the way you think it's going to work. So yeah. then you're just pushing the swing set towards a hole. <laughs> and this isn't, is this golf? It's not golf. It's, it's not fi- golf. It's yeah, just fi- me physics, laughing at physics. Physics based games are very fun and uh, silly. Yeah. I'm just, it reminds me of like goat simulator. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. There's a, there's Rag a ragdoll physics are fun. Exactly. Well, there's yeah. this really cool kind of way that they kind of play out. It's like a, it's play, it's like a playground. Mm-hmm. It's like a, that. Those are the true sandboxes in my opinion, where you get a toy and you can do anything with the toy. Yeah. It looks like a spaceman, but it can also be a cowboy and you right. can throw it against a wall mm-hmm. and do whatever you want with it. It's, it's kind of, uh, I, I find myself enthralled by some of these games. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of them are absolutely dumb and yeah. not okay. But when you add things like little objectives yeah. and things to do. Yeah. yeah. It's like Goat Simulator. That is a lot of fun for five, ten minutes. Yes. Uh, getting yeah. me to like stay and mess through all of the objectives is tough. But Well, it's essentially like a point gathering game where you're you're basically it's it's almost like a tony hawk it is almost like a tony yeah. hawk yeah well, the physics games are fun because i'm i imagine somebody playing one of the skate games did a trick that no one thought was possible yep. because there's the way the physics are in the game allow you to 
do things that were unexpected, which is totally. always one of the most fun things for me mm-hmm. in a video game when I agree. you're That's, breaking what the and what was intended. Yeah. 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 I love that. Uh just exploring depth. And yeah, every hole in this game has a different like set of objectives or different rules that it works by, and you just okay. have to figure it out by doing it. And then there's like so once you beat a hole and it unlocks like a hard mode, which is you know, a different set of objectives with the same rules and like an iteration on the first objectives. I like and, that. And uh, it's super fun. I, I didn't think that I would like it, you know. Um, but, yeah, I'm just having a blast with that. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Good records. Yeah. Well, let's let's talk about the topic at hand. Video games you can't stop thinking about. Yes. I, and I went over this in my head a few times. Like, is this a good topic? And is. is this just going to be us vibing on what our favorite games are and i didn't want that to be the okay. only objective yeah i was yes. thinking about that too um it's games for one reason or another you often find yourself contemplating mm-hmm. or uh, they just come up to your mind at uh infrequent irregular moments where you're like oh yeah fuck that game and my list that i kind of was looking through is largely a lot of games i love but not just because i mean they're also games like sui Coden. Love that game. I never think about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, but there are games that are not necessarily great that I find myself thinking of often as well. Uh, Dragon Ball Z Kakarot. I do think about that game. I'm very happy I played it because mm. it's refreshing to play bad games because you find more appreciation for like what they could have done differently. It helps you think yeah, about I like your attitude. <laughs> I, I will admit when I'm playing a fucking terrible game. Oh, yeah. Kakarot was a terrible game. Yeah. And I beat it. Well, it was playable at the very least. It, it had Krillin, so that's at the very least it had Krillin. So <laughs> you love Krillin. Uh yeah. You're in love with Krillin. Once he once he thrills. gets hair, I was out. I'm like, that's goes from Josh to Chet, and I don't want no part of Chet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh yeah. Jordan, we'll go with you first. What 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 games do you find yourself often just uh, coming up out of nowhere? So I guess I was like you and wasn't sure if I should be just making a list of my favorite games because I think about those often. But now that I'm like actively developing games, there are a lot of games that I draw from as just like things that hit me at certain times in my life that were really inspiring to be like to open the the doors for me to think about like what a video game would mean to me or whatever um so and the other thing is that i play mostly retro games so i mean my my nes console is front and center in my house um and do you have a top loader or the the old school one i have a i have two front loaders i have an avs console for my hd tv and then I have a Famicom as well. Okay. Uh, which is a top loader. So, yes, I have a top loader. Yeah. <laughs> Just not from the US. Yeah. Um, one of the themes I'm really hung up on in video games is licensing cross platform media works and stuff. I like a lot of bad NES games that are film tie ins. It's like uh, kind of one of my hallmarks. Like, you know, my first NES game was a tie in for my rock band which was based on my love of bad movie tie-ins and there's just a lot of like spinal tap i love spinal tap i mean one of my yeah favorites. yeah but again just like the cross media tie-in landscape but pc game from the early 90s there was a game called william shatner's tech war yeah william which, shatner's tech war tech war tech war t-e-k okay space w-a-r yeah now this is like a terrible game. This is a terrible game. <laughs> okay. But it's one of the first games that I ever played with, with FMV in it. And yeah. it was all narration by William Shatner <laughs> okay. setting up this dystopian sci-fi landscape where it's, it's FMV of Shatner talking. Yes. Okay. Of setting the premise of this. I game. think about this all the time too. Yeah. Tech, <laughs> Tech war was apparently a novel series that he put his name on that was ghost written by somebody else. Okay. So this is like, <laughs> this I is guess amazing. this is after star Trek, the next generation, I guess, William Shatner in the 90s trying to make some money. I don't know. Uh, how William else. Shatner every single year of his life trying to make some money. But this is exceptional Shatner. This is like... Next level he, Shatner? Yeah, next okay. level Shatner. So he wrote a novel series about this thing called Tech War, and tech is a drug. 
kind of like uh, oh, I'm so it's, in love with this concept. It's it's a it's a stand-in for crack cocaine. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Because but it's some sort of data chip that you ingest or put in your brain, and then it makes you want more, which is I guess all the premise is about. Uh, and so you you play as some sort of narcotics officer. Okay. Uh, and it's a first person shooter. Wow. And it's based around this metro, subway metro, where you can take this metro to different areas of the city. And uh, basically, I think you're just hunting drug users and shooting up buildings. It's really... It's kind of like a Charles Bronson vibe to it. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's very much... Vigilante justice. It's very vigilante, but you you also have amnesia. There's like all these tropes that are thrown into it that make it very not good. <laughs> Do, it, but but it sounds like enjoyable at the same time. It sounds fascinating. It's it's a fascinating like why did this get made? Kind yeah, of thing. And it, it, I had Papa Shatner needed a paycheck. So I had <laughs> uh, so it was distributed in the early '90s as Shareware, and that's how I first discovered it. Yeah, and you know I probably played the Shareware levels like dozens and dozens of times because I was I was it was free, it was available, and I was so fascinated by this concept. Um, because it seemed inappropriate even then, I guess. Yeah. You know, cause you're just kind of executing criminals <laughs> in the future because they once took a drug or something. And it's like, I, this sounds amazing. And it's it, because I think I want to, I'm guessing, but I want to say it was like 92 or three. So it, probably later in the nineties, like post war on drugs, like hot war on drugs. You know what I mean? The Reagan era. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, indiscriminately killing drug users in the street kind of had lost its appeal. <laughs> at that well, point, yeah. I guess. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you know. Here, let's. Um, we might have a quick ad, but we're gonna listen to one of the cutscenes. These are good, and you could. There's a super cut. You can watch just the cutscenes, and that's probably all that you need from this game. If the tech lords have developed a way to broadcast tech using the Matrix. Fiction would be universal. I don't intend to let that happen. That's where you come in. Find out if there's a connection and eliminate the threat. Do a good job, and I think I can get you released permanently. Screw up, you're back on ice. One of my operatives reported seeing Miles Connor down in the freezer. Yeah. What a big time operator. So this was Miles like Connor. Peak. This was like peak 90s PC, like we have to make it multimedia to sell this game. You yeah. know, like the whole concept of multimedia was like music and FMV and <laughs> first person shooters. Like it's, you just threw everything at this game and it's so bad. But I feel like explaining it to people is interesting enough, you know? It's honestly something I've never heard about. So even just that alone. I just love the bizarre corners of licensed video gaming. Mm -hmm. Just like, why did why was there an Elf game for the Sega Master System? Why is there a home improvement People game really on the Super the Nintendo where you fight dinosaurs? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But like, <laughs> saying those things out loud have so much value to me. Because like wondering, like why is Tim Allen in a game with dinosaurs? It's like, well... Because God is good. <laughs> yes. Well, it was one of the most successful sitcoms of the time. I can tell you why they chose to use the Dinosaurs. product. Well, and, and, product. And, and, oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, of course. The Sh like Shatner. Yeah, that's going to sell product. Mm -hmm. It is. When even as he, at this point, I believe he was still openly mocking the Star, Star Trek fan base. At that point, probably, yeah. Get There's like a book called get your own life or something like that <laughs> that he wrote yeah and it was about the fandom culture it's it's i have never read it but i hear it's a little scathing 20 bucks wow. for a signature yeah it, yeah uh one one of the i mean there's an impetus for why i wanted to do this topic and it is kentucky route zero aha uh -huh. yes which uh -huh. it's on the switch you should i think you'd dig it honestly okay. it's, but it's, yeah. i i will not say this is one of my favorite video games of mm -hmm. all time because it I don't think it it has a lot of gameplay. It is one of my favorite experiences though I've had yeah. with video games. And every time I'm playing some real obscure weird indie, I just go right to Kentucky Route Zero. I'm like, what made this game click so hard? Mm -hmm. What is it about the approach to art and storytelling that it's just uh, it works. Something clicks because I'll play other games and yeah. they'll they'll try and get me hooked with elements of their story and it just immediately falls apart. 
Yeah. Something about the world that was fashioned in this game, I can't help but always think about. And also, the the like the status of where our country is, where society is, mm-hmm. uh, how the rich are getting richer and the poor are being more put down and treated like garbage. And I just I keep thinking about Conway taking that drink of alcohol for the company and selling mm-hmm. his soul. And I think about that every time. Like I'm yeah, I contemplate work I'm like. Do I want to sell my soul? Do I want to lose a part of who I am for a company? And what part of you becomes that synthetic beast that he doesn't want to turn into? I'm getting chills just thinking about it. I the game. really did get chills thinking about this game. There there's so if if you're unfamiliar, it is essentially a it's a storytelling quote unquote game where you are moving characters around much like an adventure game, but it's more based on the text that you're reading rather than solving actual puzzles. Okay. The only puzzle that really takes form is when you're navigating what's called the zero, which is this, uh, underground ethereal, almost like mindscape highway. Oh my God. That <laughs> it's, so, it's so good. I'm describing <laughs> it actually very well. I'm very surprised. <laughs> yeah. And you have to make like proper turns when you see certain things around it. And it's literally just a circle. It is a zero. And then you have to kind of like unlocking like a safe. Oh wow. To I, get to certain story beats. And there's like this wicked, like, undercut sense of humor along with this brutal existential crisis. It is gorgeous. Released in five parts over like five or six, seven years. It was seven years. Uh, It's Americana. It's folklore. What the soul of America is, is, and that's, that's what really clicks with me. And the gameplay is almost non-existent. No, Uh, you are active in that you are, just making story beat decisions. decisions and the music, but you're not really making decisions. Enough. You're, you're, you're bringing you're, details in as if you're helping write the novel. That so it's like emergent is. storytelling. Th- there's something incredibly simple that happens early on. You have a dog that's always with you and they're like, what's the dog's name? You can say his name is blue or something like blue that. Or Homer. Or you can say, I don't know. It's just some dog. Yeah. And just that concept. I'm like, that just defines so much about <laughs> yeah. who you who, are and your yeah, relationship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's, there's so many moments that, I just think about and it's June, June it's, Bugs song. Yeah. I mean, the music in that game oh. is, is insane. Well. I, I do. The bed I, quote I, I, ramblers yeah, and Fools thinking about it. Yeah. So. It's got some real good folky bluegrass. It's got, oh. uh, some awesome, like synthy music to it. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I, there's not many games that have had that effect on me. Yeah. And I honestly, I, I don't often want to go back and play it again, but I will go back and just listen to the music, and it yeah. just takes me right there. That's awesome. Kentucky Route Zero is, yeah, it is a high art in the form of a video game. Yeah. Not necessarily using all the strengths of gaming, but it is a, a, a valuable piece of art, I believe. Yes. That game made me cry. Nice. That game like brought me to sheer tears. Yeah, I think the that, horse that, is dead. You know, yeah. the, when video games make you feel something, that's like a very powerful thing. Yeah, and because I think, you're a part of it. Yeah, especially when it draws you in deep enough that you're actually having visceral, like emotional reactions to stuff happening. It, it's, it's a, it's a profound thing, you know. Mm-hmm. And especially like when you are along for the ride as like an interactive thing. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like mm-hmm. you're you're a part of the story. Beautiful. Yeah, it's wonderful. How about you, Tyler? Um, there were several games that came to mind. Um, I made a short list. There's a few that I think about for literally no reason. I don't know why. I don't even remember much about the game, but I just constantly end up thinking about them. Yeah. Um, it'd be very easy for me to just say The Witcher Three, because okay. honestly, that is the game I think about the most. I think about it probably several times a week. Wow. Is it the, the the world design? I know you're you're a huge fan of lore building and uh, it's the lore, the world design, just the the characters, the decisions, the fact that what you do matters. The boobies, <laughs> oh yeah, the boobies. Uh, no, but I felt this my strong... first time seeing boobies. Nice. Though. <laughs> I had a really strong. Am I a virgin? So <laughs> not in the does game. This, does this count? Oh, does this count? Uh, no, that game. I felt a really strong connection with the characters and the. It was just a very well done game, but I don't want to say The Witcher Three because okay. that would be a cop out for me. So the other game that I think about just a weird amount is Gun for the PlayStation Two. Uh, 
And GameCube and Xbox. Yes. I think about guns. <laughs> and and a lot. your and, fridge soon. <laughs> and I have Don't let me die with my boots on. Yeah. That's a lie. Oh, I think about gun a lot. Yeah. Why aren't I, you supposed to die with your boots on? The, no, the, one of the enemies, like if you kill him and it's not like a, and it's not like a fatal one and he's kind of dying. I just remember being on a riverboat. Yeah. That's the beginning of the oh, game. Yeah. yeah. And then that guy throws, the you know, gun. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've played. Yeah. I had a PlayStation two for a while and I played a handful of those games. Gun was one of them. Gun sure. is so weird. I just, rem- I remember I beat the game cause you, you crush a dude with a giant boulder at the end. Yeah. Cause he's sure. throwing dynamite. Yeah. 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 Um, but I remember that was one of the first times that like I felt like the game was really trying to like take a real cinematic approach mm-hmm. to the video game because back when I played PlayStation 2 at my dad's house I mean I played a, a wide array of games but I played a lot of sports games because my dad was the one buying the games mm-hmm. I was a child sure. so a lot of March Madness and NHL and football I had Grand Theft Auto I had a handful of other games but nothing that really felt like this very like almost like you're playing a movie mm-hmm. And yeah, so once I got into the world of gun and just it left an impact because I think it was the first truly like cinematic video game experience I ever had. And it it definitely shaped the way that I played games moving forward because I deviated from like it was almost like that game fell at the fork in a road and I could go one way or the other. And I went down the cinematic single player experience and just didn't mm. look back. Cause now all my favorite games are that style one way or another, like the Witcher three, the last of us, God of war, heavy rain, heavy rains up there too. That was a weird game, but Jason yeah, gun was great. Jason. I have to, I'll have to look up gun. I haven't, I remember hearing about it and like reading like, ads and reviews back in the day but i never actually played it it's Um, it's a solid eight out of ten game if you really want to break it down it was i feel like also i don't know how it was like before red dead redemption came along that was like the it was around the time of red dead revolver if i remember yeah Yeah, which was was also another really fun yeah but it was also before that i feel like it established a lot for that vibe Mm -hmm. and i i feel like it didn't I felt like it was a really like kind of grisly game. Like it was dark, yeah, very, and yeah. like just it felt like a like a rated R movie. Very and me as a kid, I was like, "This is my jam right now." Plus, if I remember correctly, it handles really smooth. Yeah, the character can make like tight turns and do stuff, but it doesn't look stupid. I feel like this is early motion capture. Yeah, I also yeah. remember the horse in that game. Yeah, as well. The horse is pretty wonderful. And, and that then, being like a big upgrade from like the other. I remember like Ocarina of Time had a horse, and that mm-hmm. was like a big thing. Yeah. And then it wasn't until the PlayStation Two that that felt like it even got an upgrade, and it was through Gun. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Gun and plus in Gun, I feel like. If I remember correctly, the first town you get to is almost like a little open world in and of itself because there's like a gunsmith. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's the the brothel or whatever you're Which supposed to go to. Which has all the games in it too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And brothels you, have the best mini games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You got bar dice. Yes. You got, what is it? The the, the, the tickets you get? X, 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 what, X, 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 X. What is that? What? Uh, pull tabs. Pull, pull tabs. tabs. Yeah. yeah. That's mm. the, I've never seen them anywhere other than Wisconsin. I was like, it took me a long time to play my first pull tab. It wasn't a brothel, but why did <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Okay, Brad. It was a mini game though. Yeah. It was a strip club. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Gun gun rules. I, yeah. I actually kinda wanna play that again. Uh yeah, and then just for funsies, the honorable mentions were uh The Suffering on PlayStation Two hmm. and uh Final Fantasy Ten. Final Fantasy Ten. My first Final Fantasy game. That so I that, that taught you how to laugh. There's everyone's I friend. haven't beaten that game. Final Fantasy Ten? Yep. It's not a. It's not. It's not, not a difficulty. I hope. No, I just something or other happens, and you just didn't want to finish it. Put mm-hmm. it away. Yeah. yeah, there it is. I think yeah. uh, in my mind, it's That's a much better last game forever than it if you never is. finish it. Yeah, but yeah, those You're are always on the quest. Missions. Awesome. Uh, my choice is well, I have I have really mostly like two that I actually brought to the table. Yeah. Uh, my first one is the first Metroid Prime. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that game is good. It is not a great video game. And at the time, it was absolutely revolutionary. It absolutely did everything right that it was supposed to do. They, they made a Metroid game in the 3D 
first person shooter with a GameCube controller with a GameCube controller. <laughs> and it, but the thing they do is that they, they it's, it's all about lock on mechanics. So it's all just about crowd control and what you're doing mm. and then movement and strafing and all this other stuff. It's so weird. And the exploration is so good. The puzzle solving is so on point. I can probably like, I mean, in the music, like everything about it all coalesced Games didn't look like this. And I don't think people give Metroid Prime enough credit because that was the best looking game in the entire market by the time 2002 rolled around, period. It had it, like just pure environmental effects. Uh, the fact that when you were in like a cold place and Sam and Samus breathed, uh, breathed, breathed into her visor, you yeah. could see her reflection Fuck. in her face. Oh, yeah. Or when there was lights in the dark, you could see her eyes kind of shine through it. And it's just... I replayed it about a year ago on my Wii because I've got the Metroid collection, and the trilogy. With the Wii, it's got different controls, right? It's different. And good. It's actually... Or maybe not as good. It's not better, but it is good. Yeah. It, it, uh, it works. Let's put it that way. There's a lot of resetting the controller, though, because you have to like put it face down on like a hard surface. Yeah. Um, it's good, but I think those, especially Metroid Prime 1 and 2, they need that lock-on. The trigger is the lock-on, and the gun is, or the firing mechanism is one of the buttons. And I want to play it again just to try and wrap my mind around that control scheme. I played it a bunch of times yeah. back in the day, but when I when I do think about it now, it's... it's we, we, are, we have first-person shooters. We know how they yeah. work. Yeah. Nintendo's like, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> Fuck all that. Yeah. We're going to make something else. And there's a lot of platforming in that game, a lot of exploration, a lot of backtracking. The platforming actually kind of works. Yeah. And not so much in the first one, but the second one, actually, they they make kind of a, I think they make a few concessions. And I think there's actually kind of like a tether where if you get close enough, they're just going to let you have it. Yeah. Um, Which makes the game a little more to, you know, deal with. Uh, there are some parts of that game that are weird and dumb, like getting all the specific runes to unlock the entrance to the final boss area, which is the Metroid Prime. Yeah. Um, otherwise, I, I don't know. It's a game I think about a lot because it. I'm I'm all about exploration in video games. So when you give me an opportunity to kind of just be set loose into all these environments and figure stuff out, there's scan- stuff you scan on the walls and you learn like the hidden history of it. You feel like an archaeologist. Mm-hmm. Games didn't do that. Yeah, that really handled uh, world building and telling a story in the background very well for the time. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, definitely Metroid Prime right up there. Yeah. It's got to be. I. I think about that soundtrack once ever. I should just own it on vinyl if I can get it. But. It'd be a bootleg. I'm sure it's out there. Oh, yeah. Uh, how about Prime 4? Is it ever coming? Yes. When's, coming. It, com- when's it coming? Uh, let's make a prediction here. Uh, I would say I'm going to guess mid-2023. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> I think it's going to be right after whatever Nintendo replaces EA with. And I think it's gonna, they're going to give it a two-month window. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Jordan. Another game you can't stop thinking about. Um, so another game that's always stuck with me is a PlayStation 1 game from Square called Bushido Blade. Bushido Blade. Okay. Yes, this is probably my favorite fighting game. I mean, yes, there are fighting games that I've spent more time with because they're arcade games. Mm-hmm. And I actually you know, played them competitively, or at least whatever minor sure. uh, version of that, playing kids after school or whatever. But... Bushido Blade was the first. I, I never had a PlayStation, so this was a game that I would only play at friends' houses. And mm-hmm. I think I actually bought a copy so that I could have it. Sure. Like when I was going over to a friend's house, mm-hmm. because everybody had a PlayStation back in the day. I had a sixty-four. Yeah, me too. Um, I which, feel you. Which meant you know I was in this weird position. So I I still have my copy of Bushido Blade with my memory card, oh. which is the only PlayStation game I have. That's amazing. And owning uh, a game and a memory card for a system you don't have. Yes, that's awesome. Well, that's that's my Persona Four Golden. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I played that game so much and loved it so much because of how awkward it was. Um, it's a game. It's a fighting game without a health bar. Mm-hmm. So um, it's based on a, 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 
a mobility system, I guess, because you can choose your weapon and choose your fighter. Sure. And each fighter's got different attributes that will use different weapons differently, you know, accordingly, I guess. And they're specialists in different uh, fields or whatever. But if you, you know, so if you cho- choose a broadsword or whatever and choose somebody with a katana or something mm-hmm. as your enemy, they're going to be faster than you. So you need to make decisions based on that, you know. But the nice thing is because it doesn't have a health bar is that it's set up on a system for one hit kills, mm-hmm. which means if you're good and you place your first hit correctly, you can kill an enemy immediately. Sure. So it's based on a stance system, like a high, medium, and low. And then you have, uh, I think, three different attacks, or maybe two. But each stance has three different attacks that you can choose from, and there's different counters for each one. And it, it sounds uh, complicated, but if you start so much. Bu- button mashing, you'll notice that like if you're both button mashing, you'll just be parrying each other the whole time. Yeah. Because an attack is also a parry. Oh, okay. So then you're just figuring out a way to connect the or get past a connection of attacks. Exactly. Or okay. how to evade somebody to attack where they're not blocking. Okay. So it actually becomes a pretty complex system and, you know, if you have somebody who even remotely knows what they're doing, you know, playing against a a, a like-minded player uh, can be really really fun. And mm-hmm. the the cool thing is that if Rather than, a, again, a health meter is that you can disable your opponent by hitting them in the legs or in the arm. And if they have like a, a, a two-handed uh, weapon, mm-hmm. like a spear or something, they can only use it with one one arm, which means they're slower. And then and it's just kind of weaker. And on top of that, you can hit them in the legs, which immobilizes them. Mm. So there are these situations where you're fighting an opponent who is down literally laying on the ground because they can't stand yeah, up that's and awesome. they've got one arm and they're just like, then they end up just like rolling around and <laughs> spearing you somehow out of pure luck. And it creates these like kind of storylines in each battle where some of these battles can last five seconds or a good like two and a half minutes. And it's like a battle of wits. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, I dig stuff like that where it's kind of, it's not even, it's not what you would call like the realistic approach but it's in some ways it is though because yeah. you don't have a health meter and if you get hit with a sword it's not for good. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I'm surprised so Bushido Blade 1 and 2 were made and that right. was the last in that official line. Yes. There's a spiritual successor called Kengo. Wow. And there are four of those games. The last one came out 2006 for the 360 but it seems like a really unique uh, approach to a fighting game it is and i'm a huge film buff and i really love old black and white samurai movies like i really love kurosawa I really love kurosawa yeah and and Zuichi, like Ichi, the blind swordsman zatoichi yeah zatoichi and there's like you know even like the lone wolf and cub series and the um even the like the samurai miniseries that they ran in japan um which was like a six part kind of epic um i've never seen that it's good it's starring um to share Mufune as well. Mm. Oh. And uh, there are so many iconic, like we all understand the beats of a samurai duel and we all know like the buildup of intensity and the eyes and like the way that like movement is communicative and we, you know, like there's a poetry to it mm-hmm. in the same way that Sergio Leone treats a gunfight in yeah. spaghetti Westerns, that there's like this in- intensity that's building up. And I feel like Bushido Blade is captures that better than any video game that I've ever played mm-hmm. because the settings for one are very iconic kind of samurai settings. Like you can fight in a bamboo forest where you can cut down the bamboo around you. Uh, you can fight like on a, a, a beach with a sunset kind of thing or in front uh, of a waterfall where you can actually like, you can actually lean down and splash water in your opponent's face to blind them. No shit. And there's like all these environmental things that happen in the game. I want to kill bill modern version of Bushido blade. Yeah, totally. Totally. That's not bad. I, I think, like that. you know, and on top of all of that, there is a black and white mode, which just seals the deal for me. On the PlayStation. Yeah, because you can turn it in on black and white mode and it just, you know, it's polygons, yes, but it has so much samurai movie vibe to it. They chose their colors well then. So, yes. Yeah. yeah. So the grayscale looks excellent. Okay. Um, and yeah, it just, it gives all this vibe. The 
the one player mode has like this weird story element where you can just run around the, like where all of the battle stages are connected yeah and you can actually move the battle along by running away from your opponent just to different areas oh it's kind of like a nidhog have you ever played that uh, no you would actually love nidhog nice and it's, it's kind of a bushido blade but there's also a there's also an element of bushido blade where like there's you have to follow the bushido code and in every match your opponent is saying something to you and in like this dramatic samurai thing and you can literally just walk up to them and kill them while they're uh, talking to you, but you can't finish you the game. You have no honor. Exactly. Yeah. You can't finish the game because you've broken the code. Oh. Um, and so, like, there's all these internal rules to the game that you just kind of have to figure out by playing it. And wow, I just spent so much time with that game. Yeah. And fell in love with that mechanic and that system so deeply. I mean, that's. I think that's that's realistic, you know, also that a battle can be done in a second, it's all the intensity is leading up to it, but then it can be done. If Zangief does a 720 pile driver to my neck, I'm dead the yeah. first hit. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you are. Yeah. But you know, in a competitive sense, like when you're shit talking with your friend and you're like, oh, I'm going to take you out this round, and then you rush in and attack them really quickly and they just sidestep you and take your head off. And it's v- hilarious. It creates <laughs> all these situations where, like, well, I tried really hard, but then I just made one wrong move and now I'm dead. Yeah. And, you know, because the, the, the battles are so quick and they reset so quickly, it's like you can have a dozen of those little mistakes that you're both laughing at really quickly and just creates the coolest like mini storylines. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm going to go with a game that isn't good. I have one that I think about often. It's called Castlevania Harmony of Despair. Okay. Uh, Igarashi was tasked with making a multiplayer Castlevania game that it's got all of the characters from the Metroidvanias as playable options, Mm -hmm. and you can play single player. It sucks. It's designed to be played like with online, which no one played online. So it was one of the reasons it wasn't good. But um, you have essentially a giant castle map, and there's different like doors that need to be unlocked. So everyone can be doing different things on the map. And you need to work together. And you showed this to us uh, at Tom's place. Yeah. Yep. And it's a concept that I think is really cool. Like a big dungeon crawling Metroidvania with Mm -hmm. like four players with like a big boss thing. It's a game that I played a decent amount. And I was sitting there just knowing it wasn't good. But the art design, I still appreciate just being able to pull back and like see an entire Castlevania map. And it's one of those things where I think if it was delivered a little differently, it had a lot of potential. And it's one of those things. I just feel like it was a failed concept where there was a lot of good intention behind it. And I could see what they were going for. I I still just not for the life of me can understand how it failed so spectacularly, though, because it's got a lot of the right pieces. I think it just was lacking. When did it come out? Uh, This was 360 arcade heyday. Oh, I see. You do agree that it's bad, though? I, well, I mean, at certain points it's good. Well, I mean, ob- objectively, you think it's bad, but you like it. Is it's what you're saying uh, it's a waste of time. Okay. Um, if, <laughs> okay. uh, it's it's not balanced, right? If there was a single player <laughs> mode where you get items in a different fashion, and you can just there's only like nine levels unless you get DLC. Okay, but then there's oh, different boy. hard modes, and eventually, like you have to do an entire forty minute thing to get one chest. It reminds me of Destiny in a way where it's just all about uh. getting loot. And, uh, okay. and the, the grind doesn't work for me, but I'm a sucker for a Metroidvania. I'm a sucker for hanging out as Alucard or Juice Belmont. I yeah, like those people. I was actually going to say that I was considering putting Simon's Quest on my list today mm. because that was one of the first video games I ever got. And when I think about video games, Simon's Quest is one of the first images that pops in my head. Yeah. Because not that it's great as a form, but the assets, the music and the visuals and the fact that there's not really a timer. Uh, I think that you mentioned this about the Witcher three, like Simon's quest was a game that I would just put on and enjoy my time in that world. Mm -hmm. You know, it didn't matter if I was really chasing my objectives or just building up experience points or whatever. Like that was just a game that I enjoyed being around, you know? Um, Highly underrated, to be honest with you, for what it is. Some of it's obtuse, but... Because it's obtuse, I think people are easy, easily dismiss it. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think a lot of the stuff that's actually going on in that game is completely revolutionary. It's just that, 
you know, it's it's sequel. It's a sequel to a game that's like very much beloved, and it and it it's kind a little of too is, much too soon. Too it, and they they didn't have like a full story that they really wanted to tell. Yeah, they did. It's not more epic than the first one. <laughs> yeah, and I think that Simon's Quest is a little too too much too soon. Yeah, the fact that like it spun around something that worked too quickly. Yeah. And it's like people weren't asking for a Castlevania game that did something else until like 10 years later. And then they were like, you know, and if they would have followed up with Castlevania 2 being like just a next adventure, it would have been a lot more successful over time. But I think for when it came out, it was really influential on the people that played it. Yes. Because those games became really the the games that were influenced by Simon's Quest became really popular like 8 to 10 years later. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It did a lot of things uh, first. It was definitely ahead of the curve in a lot of ways. It is it is fucking obtuse, though. And that's one of the it reasons is. I think about it, it just wouldn't, as a game design concept. Like, yeah. How did this pass as what people thought was a good idea to do here? You know, I think in retrospect, for me, it's easy to enjoy it when I play it because I know the solutions to everything and I don't have to struggle with being frustrated. Yeah. You know, but then... Once so, you know the solutions, yes. So when I look back at the level of frustration, I feel it's... I, I, can, I look at it as almost artful that like everybody in the game lies to you and there's that's something really fun. beautiful about that. If that, you, that's, that's ahead of its time. If too. you know how to get through it, the thing is like, if they're lying to you and they're your only source of information to the game, that's yeah. super frustrating. Yes. And that happens several times. <laughs> yeah. And exactly. But like, you know, on the playground at school, kids would talk about that game and I would find solutions to other ways but so, so, I mean, if I didn't have that experience, I would have m- maybe not enjoyed it as much. Yeah. But looking back on it, I think like, oh, it's so cool that like you can't trust anything that anybody ever tells you in that game yeah. because it's probably wrong. Just like the real world. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a realistic simulator. You know, <clears throat> it's 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 practically an open world. Yeah. And it's got all this vibe to it. And now me being. Like an NES assets person, you know, my development life is based around music and graphics. And that game knocks both those things out of the park to the Absolutely. point where I enjoy the game just because it's so nice to just sit in it. Simon's theme, especially just yeah. like, ooh. No, uh, uh, Bloody, Bloody Tears. Bloody Tears. I mean, that song. But Requiem of Daylight, I think, is the daytime theme, too. And that one's all right. Really yeah. good. Mm-hmm. I just think all the songs in that, and it, they don't get old to me. I've been listening to the music for that since I was, you know, five or six, mm-hmm. and it still feels fresh. Like when I dig into how those echoes are made or how the pitch bends are made, it just still kind of baffles me that they did such a good job with it. You know, Simon's Quest makes me think of Elden Ring. That's it, kind of what yeah. I was thinking about earlier. Night, when, nighttime, things are just worse. Yeah. And also, don't listen to NPCs, yeah. and don't try and help them, because you're going to kill them, too. Well, that whole yeah, passive eventually. world-building thing th- that the player can discover through exploration is so, like, let people discover things at their own pace. Yeah. And there's a very, like, Dark Souls thing that's in that concept, you know? Yeah. I, For- think th- I think the limitations of the system is actually pr- uh, part of the problem with that game in specific, I think like a lot of the stuff reads as same samey. A lot of uh-huh. the, they try to like vary up the towns that you go to. Yeah, I but agree. all this all the stuff in between, it's that's the interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, do you guys have another game you'd like to mention? Yeah, I got another one. Go for it. Um, it's uh, Days Gone. I think about Days Gone a lot because I've heard the name. It's the zombie biker gang game. Zombie uh, biker? Yeah, oh. it's like a post-apocalyptic world. You got a motorcycle. You play as a biker. Okay. And uh, it's looking the, for his wife, right? Yeah, and okay. it's got that really awesome like crowd control where there's hordes of zombies that can like run at you. Uh, so it's got that fun mechanic to it. Nice. But I heard really bad things about the game when it got released that it was buggy because it was, and it just wasn't good. And I ended up picking it up like a year and a half, two years later. Mm. Discounted like under $20 deal on the PlayStation Network. Really? So really low expectations on a game that I did not think was going to be very good. And it just got really good. The story is fantastic. Once they like ironed out all the bugs, the gameplay was really fun. I felt like upgrading 
my character, my weapons, my motorcycle, all in this open world where you're constantly clearing zombie hordes and nests and also trying to find your wife. Uh, the map kept getting bigger. The, all of a sudden, at a certain point in the game, um, at a certain point in the game, I felt like I had no idea what the scope was, kind of like with Elden Ring, where, you know, mm. the map keeps going. Wait, there's a whole nother section. What the? F- and then the story keeps going. It was uh, it just was the gift that kept on giving. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's a good feeling. Mm-hmm. But then uh, the reason I think about it so much is because I once I played it, I platinumed it. I went hard, got that 100 percent completion because it was just like I am in love with this game by the end of it um i felt like they really nailed the story by the end there's actually some characters with some like honest to god character arcs okay so that i was super excited for the world leading up to a uh a possible sequel but it's just not going to get one so for me it's constantly fizzled out pretty hard yeah it's constant i constantly think about it as like a what if what could have been because it leaves you on a cliffhanger if you get a certain ending oh um and the, I mean, it has all the pieces for an amazing AAA title. If someone put some care and some thought into it, there's it's a nice post-apocalyptic survival horror game. Mm-hmm. It's got this awesome open world sandbox component, the upgrading all your different weapons. And I felt like you had real customization over how you wanted to attack the levels. If you wanted to go in stealthy or you just wanted to throw dynamite and blow shit up right away. Oh, that's cool. Mm-hmm. Um, I hear the fire mechanics in that are actually pretty cool. Oh yeah. And yeah. like the horde mechanics too. Cause there's sometimes like you'll get like on my PlayStation four, it even was kind of chuggy. I would I wonder what it would be like on the PlayStation five, but you get enough zombies running. Well, do you have you. a physical or hmm, I have a digital copy. Uh, well, I mean, you could still download that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Give it a shot. Yeah. I might go back and see what it's like on the PlayStation five because you get enough zombies running at you and I don't want to like, be wrong but i feel like there's times where you run into a horde of like 100 to 150 mm-hmm. and the game would start chugging because mm-hmm. it's just so many moving pieces yeah. so quickly in 2021 it was reported that the development team had unsuccessfully pitched a sequel to sony yeah they yeah. tried yeah it was kind of like this uh this kind of what if for a long time because it didn't sell well and then all of a sudden it started selling really well and then it kind of gained this cult following, and that's where I came in. I was like, yes, uh, please, let's fucking do this. Mm. It reminded me of like the movie Kick-Ass. Mm. Sure. How it got a sequel based off the DVD sales and yeah. not the box office. And sure. I was kind of hoping for the same thing. Like, come on, people, buy the fucking game. Yeah. I want to see Duncan's story keep going. And it just farted out at the end. It sucks. Yeah. I think about it a lot. Like, come on, that could have been so cool. That's a, the, like a, what could have been is a very interesting way to approach this topic. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Plus it just so happens to be like up there and one of my, my favorite, not, I wouldn't say favorite games, but definitely one I hold in high esteem because really? of the way it, uh, left main, an impression. Yeah. Mainly the way it impacted me, not so much the mechanics. Cause like the open world is great, but it does feel empty. Like you can hunt animals, but there's really no purpose to it. <laughs> like it, you don't get anything from it. You can't it. make like shark skin wallets. No, yeah. that would be a nice addition that could possibly go in a sequel, but that ain't going to happen. Not going to happen. Yeah. There was definitely ways the game could be improved, but the impact it left and like also, it's also great when you buy a game for like seven, eight, nine dollars and yeah. you end up getting well over yeah. 60 hours out of it and yeah. it just knocks it out of the park. Mm. So yeah, one of those happy little like, I'm going to take a chance on $7 and it really paid off for me. Nice. That's always the best. Bang for your buck. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Mine is actually something that was mentioned earlier that we had a little bit of chat about. Uh, and it is one of my favorite games of all time. But I can't, I can't make that excuse as it being a cop out because it's, uh, it's Death Stranding. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That game is in my head all the time. If only because it's kind of my job. <laughs> so I work I work as a route sales driver for a company and uh and I think I literally manifested that job into my life because of how much I liked <laughs> Death Stranding. So much of what my job is is being Sam Porter Bridges. But without uh aging rain. <laughs> <laughs> and like, you don't throw your piss at people. No, and I no, I do, <laughs> but I'm very selective about it. And they're not I'm, scary I'm monsters. Just very selective. <laughs> they're not scary monsters. They're just innocent people. Yeah, they're sca- innocent people are scary monsters yeah. sometimes too. 
But uh, that game, just the complete total vibe of it. Yeah. I didn't know if I was going to like it. The first teasers for it, just the visual imagery, everything that goes along with it. There's such like intense artistry here. And, and it feels like in the mind of Kojima, it feels like he really just needed to vent. And I think all of these ideas just splashed right on the page. If you wanted it to be like a work of art or something mm-hmm. like that, um, you it's essentially a game about managing deliveries. And the game doesn't extend far beyond that in terms of goals and what you're supposed to be doing. But there's something really gratifying and very nice about how the world interacts with you when it is allowed to. Because a lot of that game is about loneliness yeah. and fear and like devastation and dealing with something that is so like cataclysmic that you wonder why you're even trying to help these people to begin with. Mm-hmm. I got this game at a weird point in my life too. Mm-hmm. So it was just kind of transformative. But I think about it all the time because I have jackets that look like his jackets mm-hmm. and I'm doing his job every single day. <laughs> so it's like, I don't know. I, I, I always wonder if I'm getting S ranked with the star <laughs> next to it or if I'm like, or if I'm getting like an A rank somewhere along there. You're taking the packages and just throwing them at people on the street. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm throwing them at monsters. Yeah. yeah. That, that game has such wonderful tone and just game yeah. feel. Yeah. You won't be doing anything other than, I don't know if you've played the game, Jordan. I haven't, no. You, I'm are, you familiar said, with it only in discussions. You balance a, a number of packages. Or you're just managing packages. Sometimes you're driving them, but yeah. when you're walking, it's like, you're just walking. Sometimes you're going up over things and you just kind of have to balance yourself, but it, it reaches this, uh, this super zen moment. Uh, yeah. Once you get to that point, it is hopelessly addicting and you just... You're just like, I'm just doing, I got to get the packages over there. You're going to like try and route the best ways, create ways that uh, you can maximize it. And the world is just so great to be in. And the, the music, the tone. The music, those cinematic shots where it'll like zoom you way out yeah. and you're just walking alone and that music kicks in. That's probably my favorite instance wow. in that game. So I think what also really kind of inspires me about this game is, you know, like I, I think Matt actually described this very well he called it blue collar Mm sci-fi and i think what john carpenter yeah Yeah. i think what i think what separates something like that from like a normal game is that this doesn't involve a lot of killing you're fighting monsters certainly but for the most part you're avoiding them the game encourages you to avoid avoid them because facing off with them means that you might lose your packages or something like that i think the game honestly wants you to see Sam Porter Bridges as a pacifist. I don't think he wants to fight. He clearly doesn't. He just wants to get the job done. And I don't think video games allow for characters like that. Mm -hmm. Um, The game is about you taking care of an infant, too. Mm -hmm. There's something... uh, And violently shaking that infant to calm him down. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That works. He loves it. She loves it. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's in, it has like these themes of family and it's, ah, I, I can sing that. I can sing this game's praises for the it's rest awesome. of my life. These themes of Troy Baker. <laughs> yeah. And pizza delivery. It is a lot of pizza delivery. That, You've got to keep it stable. W- w- when it became beer delivery, that was just like PTSD for me a little bit. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like that guy's got a keg on his back. I know how shitty he feels. Well, this is, this is <laughs> yeah. not, well, here's the thing. This is not a game I think I can go back to easily. It will take a couple of years for me because if I'm doing this in real life, I don't want to go home and do it. Yeah. You know what right. I mean? Right. So I want to throw lightning bolts. Same reason I, I want <laughs> same reason I want to recommend Overcooked to people, but never to people that work in a kitchen. No, no, yeah. I can't play Overcooked. It's like, why would I want to go to the kitchen right now? I just I, got uh, done in the kitchen. Uh, yeah, I've gotten angry I love at partner. cooking games, but not when I'm working in kitchens. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I haven't played a cooking game in a long time. Yeah. I wouldn't, yeah. So yeah, Death Stranding. It's inherently fun. And I actually think that working in kitchen is more fun after you've played a cooking game and be like, yeah, this is, this is the same thing. I'm just You're a big timer cooking mama here. fan. Uh, Order Up was my jam on the Order Wii. Up. I never one. played that. that. That is the jam. It's a restaurant simulator. So you have to like build up your restaurant as you go and you cook oh. all the orders and stuff too. It's not bad. We're going to continue our discussion on video games and doggies after dark. 
But we are going to uh, close out this episode here of the Dogcast. So before we take off, we're going to do our one for the road where we have random recommendations for people. It could be anything, uh, movies, music, TV, books, uh, exercises, sleeping in, uh, lifestyle choices, uh, anything you want to do. I watched a really random, weird, bizarre movie the other day with Carly. I went down to Netflix and I went to the mind bending movie movie section, which I found and I'm like been in love with. But we watched this movie called Horse Girl, starring Allison Brie. I've heard about this from 2019. Nice, and it is. Wait, she's in a movie called Horse Girl. Yeah, she's yep. also in BoJack Horseman. So this is weird. Yeah, she. Uh, it is so a. Weird. It is a very. <laughs> uh, she's got like this real uh, charisma and energy. So you're drawn to the character, and then it goes off the fucking rails. Yeah, and, Netflix. You said. Yeah, and I really enjoyed it. Carly really enjoyed it, and. I won't say anything more than I, I, I believe in the conspiracy at the end. That's where I landed, but I think it's up to interpretation. Interesting. Yeah, I would recommend Horse Girl. Um, I'm going to recommend uh, that you listen to Coheed and Cambria's new album that comes out at the end of the week. It is so they good. Ju- they just dropped Comatose, the fourth single, and I oh, can't man. stop listening to it. What do you, how do you, how compared do you, to My Chemical Romance's new song, you like oh, it? Oh, everything Coheed has put out on those four singles is better than Foundations of Decay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that So the, their, their last album, Vaxis One, is... Was it Unheavenly Creatures their last Unheavenly album? Creatures, but it's yeah. Vaxxus 1. Oh, is that? Okay. That's literally On the subreddit, I get confused because I'm like, I'm missing an album. Here. Yeah. it it Yeah. So it's literally just the story of, it, it, I mean, it's high concept album stuff, but uh, there's, uh, my favorite track is uh, Liar's Club. Yes. Oof. That is such a good and song. And apparently uh, Rise Naniasha. That's a good Cut one the too. Chord has a different name on the album. It's like a spoiler. I, I guess so. I'm avoiding all spoilers. I honestly don't even know if because I thought the album came out on the sixth. I guess it's the twenty sixth. Okay. So I'm really hoping I read that right. But the album is leaked, so you can go listen to it. So that makes me feel like I am oh. on the right track. But okay. since then, I've avoided because I do want to just listen to it when it comes out. But Comatose, the choice. new track, is just so good. All four of the songs. I'm going to be listen. I'm going to be listening to it on my ride home. Yeah, absolutely. I listen to it on the way here. I'm going to listen to it on the way home. <laughs> Um, I'm actually going to recommend a band as well. Um, I've been having a lot of uh, feelings lately, and uh, <laughs> there's a band called The Deer Hunter. Mm, Not right. Deer Hunter. Oh. Yeah. The Deer Hunter. Don't know and uh, it's it's a lot of it's also kind of in the vein of Coheed, where it's uh, concept albums and stuff like that. And it's the story of this character named Hunter who survives in the early 20th century and falls in love and does a bunch of stuff and ends up having like an untimely death by the, by the final like fifth album. And it's this whole story of his life and it's, and it's full chocked full of real bangers, a ton of like theatrical emotions. And it would, I just find myself vibing to it. In fact, I'll recommend a song from the fourth album. That's really got me going. It's called the squeaky wheel. And it's like this, ballad about like how people lie to each other even though they're like in love and like they're questioning it and it's it's just really interesting nice. do you have any recommendations you'd like to say jordan uh well um yeah since i'm an nes developer i figured i would talk give some recommendations on nes homebrew mm-hmm. okay. um so i think if anyone were to be interested in approaching the nes to play anything new i would probably recommend micromages which is a game from germany um by a group called Morphcat. Uh, so it's a four player um it's a four player platforming game which is basically, it's kind of like Super Meat Boy, where you're jumping up walls. It's basically um, based on a wall jumping mechanic. And it's half party game and half kind of high score chasing game. Okay. Um, I would say less high score. There's a high score element to it, but it's more of a a co-opetition game. Mm -hmm. So you're basically racing to the top of the tower each stage. 
and you can jump on each other's heads and kind of push each other off of platforms. Oh, I like so, that. So it has like this kind of um, competitive bubble wobble kind of thing sure. happening. So it's like kind of half arcade, half adventure game. Oh. Um, and because it's four players, they use really tiny sprites so that it looks really good on the NES's uh, scanline limitations. Oh. Um, because, you know, you can't have more than eight sprites on a, on a horizontal line for the NES. Oh, I had no clue about that. Yeah, it's one of the, that's what causes flicker. So when you have more uh, sprites on that scan line, the the programmers would put in code so that it would cycle through the sprites on that scan line. Oh, okay. So when you're seeing flicker, you're actually seeing them being um, alternated so that you can see everything happening at the same time. Oh, I learned something new today. <laughs> yeah, that's great. but a single, a single sprite is only eight pixels, so um, you can have eight... Uh, eight by eight sprites next to each other um, if you're using small sprites and it won't cause any flicker at all. Okay. So this game is optimized to use really tiny sprites with really high level of detail in the animation. Okay. So it looks really good. Um, I'm trying to picture eight in my head. It's so if you, tiny Mario is four eight by eight sprites. So imagine just okay. his leg, like one of his legs. Oh, I see. Is an eight by eight sprite. Okay. So imagine the whole character is animated within that little box. Interesting. So it's super, it's super pixelated. However, they are able to fit a lot of frames of animation in there. So when it jumps and, and falls and bounces and stuff, you get a, a really high level of detail. Interesting. Um, but all of those things put together, it's a four player game, which means, in, and it has a party aspect to it too. So when playing it with friends, there's like no more fun game to play multiplayer on the nes and that's including like the entire 700 games in the library right big um, recommendation big big yeah i mean i think it, it, i i always refer to it as like the beatles of nes homebrew um because it's just like micromages because there's four of them <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> But it's it, Micromages is, is um, developed on the same mapper board that the original Super Mario Brothers uses. Mm -hmm. So that's 40 KB of, of memory. Wow. Kilobytes. Uh, and all the original black box games use really simple hardware. Mm -hmm. So that board is like you only get one page of gra like graphics for the, the sprites. You only get one page of graphics per level. Um, for the the background images and stuff, so it's wow. like a very very strict limitations that they were working with. Sure. And if you play this game, you would think that it's the same hardware as like a Super Mario three or like a Kirby's Dream Land, because it's oh. really really high level of animation and really high level of optimization. So outside, outside of an emulator, you're going to need one of those weird multi tap things to play four player. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, so pa that's power score four score four score or and seven the, years ago. NES satellite has one too, I think, which is the radio control thing. It's like a, uh, um, yeah, but I've, I've never used one of those. I have no idea how it works, hmm. but I've also got a, a retro USB AVS console, which has, it's basically an HD NES with four inputs on the front of it. Fuck so yeah. It just skips that. But I recommend a four score for anybody that likes the NES because it also has turbo buttons on it. Mm. So you can just, and, and it's a, a controller extension as well for like modern TVs. It's easy just to like plug it in and drag it across. Don't want to hurt room. your eyes, huh? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It was different when you had a little CRT. Now people are sitting in front of these big HD monsters. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so check out Micromages. And before uh, we take off, you also had mentioned something uh, messaging the other day about an event at Boone and Crockett and the Cooperage. Is that something you'd want to talk about here? Or is that not yet? We're still kind of putting it together, but my intentions are to do a bunch of events this summer with pop-up arcades with Milwaukee indie developers. Um, because now that I'm releasing games, people are kind of knowing i mean i'm getting plugged into other developers that are working in the area too not just on the nes but with you know um, games being released on steam and, and itch.io and, and different pc platforms as well yeah right. so you know milwaukee has got a long way to go as far as being like a tech giant or whatever but there are a lot of people doing a lot of programming here and a lot of interesting stuff happening in, in the c-sharp web web development stuff too which is just kind of a, a you know a step away from games as it is sure um so you know i'm trying to kind of unite with other indie developers and just kind of like join forces and strengthen numbers yeah show off what we're doing and do it at a bar yeah and hopefully just i'll like, show up you know invade we'll be there 
you know, because I'm a musician and I've played in, in bands forever, like I know a lot of the music venues and I know a lot of the promoters in town. So, you know, promoting pop-up indie arcades like it was banned or like a group of, you know, in a different sense. It's like the same kind of thing. Yeah. So I'm hoping to get Milwaukee Games kind of out into the, the bigger community. And as we learn more about that here, we'll make sure to keep everyone informed. Yeah. Right on. Absolutely. Uh, Hair of the Dogcast exists because of people like you. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or thoughts about this episode or anything at all, you can reach out to us on Instagram at Hair of the Dogcast, on Twitter at Hot Dogcast, and you can also email us at Hair of the Dogcast at gmail.com. For access to a bunch of bonus episodes, our after show, Doggies After Dark, our movie podcast, uh, Popcorn Dogs, as well as early episodes of Elden Dogs and Raw Dogs. There's a lot of dogs. Uh, check out patreon.com slash the dogcast. Executive producers, Ryan, Christy, Nick, Tyler Keller, Kip, the killer homebrew NES guy, uh, Brian Ward and Katie Bone. Thank you for supporting us. Y'all are great. Um, HyperX Podcast Network. Check it out. Lots of great shows. Check out podcast.hyperx.com. We love you. Yeah. Play, play some games. Make room for huge plays with the HyperX Alloy Origin 65 Mechanical Gaming Keyboard and the Pulse Fire Haste Wireless Mouse. The Alloy Origin 65 has a functionally compact form factor, keeping the arrow keys without the number pad and function keys. The Pulse Fire Haste is the lightest wireless mouse from HyperX featuring a robust connection, up to 100 hours of battery life, and is even water resistant. The Alloy Origin 65 and Pulsefire Haste Wireless keep your setup clean and clutter-free with the Alloy Origin 65 mechanical keyboard and the Pulsefire Haste Wireless Mouse.